Good evening. I'm Larry King, and welcome to our YouTube uh, pre-debate presentation as we look forward to tonight's vice presidential debate. We're coming to you from our Aura Studios in Glendale, California. Our panelists will include Megan McCain. She'll be with us throughout following the debate. We'll be on for an hour. Tanya Acker, the Democratic strategist. Howard Bragman, the vice chairman of Reputation.com. On the pre-show, joining us in Ithaca, New York, is uh, by Google uh, Hangout, by the way, Svante Weirich. He is the young Democratic mayor of Ithaca, New York. Couple of notes. This is the first and only vice presidential debate. There are three presidential debates. Next one's Tuesday. 69-year-old Joe Biden, 42-year-old Paul Ryan. The venue is the Center College in Danville, Kentucky. Uh, the moderator of the debate is Martha Raddatz of ABC News. The candidates, by the way, will be seated. The debate is broken down into nine, ten-minute segments. The moderator starts each segment with a question. They have two minutes to answer, and the balance is a discussion about that question. The debate covers both foreign and domestic policy. It's the ninth televised uh, vice presidential debate. You expect anything important to happen tonight, Megan? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think this is a great opportunity for Paul Ryan to continue on the momentum that Mitt Romney started last week. And, um, you know, I think the only thing he really needs to be careful of is not looking like sort of like a, a spoiled kid. It's really dangerous when you're debating someone much older and more established than you are. And I think that's the only thing he really has to worry about. <clears throat> Tanya, what is what your read? I, I, I agree with that. I think that Ryan uh, certainly is going to have his work cut out for him. Joe Biden, uh, look, people spend a lot of time talking about the gaffes that he makes from time to time. But that being said, he's a masterful debater. He knows how to connect with working American people. Uh, and they're going to be a critical constituency in this election. Howard? You know, obviously, I, I think I was surprised. A lot of people were surprised at how badly his performance in the first debate hurt Obama. And Joe Biden has a very challenging job, even for an experienced debater, and it is to try and stop that bleeding right now and get out there. And we know Joe Biden's tough. We know he's smart. We also know he's gaff prone. So I think it's going to be fascinating. I think it's going to be blood sport out there, to be honest. Yeah. yeah Svante, what are you expecting? Expect, uh, I, I had the opportunity to go to Charlotte and for the Democratic National Convention. I'll tell you, watching all of those speeches, the only, the best defense, and actually the best uh, spokesperson for a second Obama term was Bill Clinton. And I don't think they're going to allow him to debate. But the second best defense came from Joe Biden. And as, as gaff prone as he is in those three to five second uh, out of context clips, when you give him extended range to really explain himself, nobody connects better, I, I think, with your average voter than a Joe Biden. So. I actually expect that he'll come out very strong, and, and uh, I don't know if he'll be strong enough to reverse the damage done by the last debate. I don't think we should underestimate Paul Ryan, though. I mean, this is a man who has done literally over 100 interviews since he was chosen. First as debate a on a national stage, though. He's a very, I've, I've very rarely seen better than when I've seen Paul Ryan doing interviews. And Joe <clears throat> Biden has done one interview in the past five months with um, uh, New York Magazine, which isn't exactly a publication I would go to if I'm trying to swing, swing voters in middle America. So I just think Paul Ryan's been at it a lot longer um, in the more recent time. And let me, let me add one thing, Larry. Paul Ryan comes from a very balanced district. It's not necessarily Republican or Democratic. He's won multiple terms. I think he's been in office 14 years. He knows how to sell conservative ideas in a moderate way, and he's very good at that, and I wouldn't underestimate him. Tanya, polls indicate the Pew Research thinks the, the public thinks Ryan's going to do better than, than, than Biden tonight. Well, I, I think that that could really be a function of what we see any time a challenger is debating the incumbent. Uh, uh, challengers historically do better. Uh, presidential challengers do better in the first debate. Uh, VP challengers uh, do well. Look, I, sometimes. Um, I, I don't underestimate Paul Ryan. I think that notwithstanding his youth uh, and notwithstanding the fact that he doesn't have uh, the experience on this stage that Joe Biden does, I think that he's formidable. I think that what Joe Biden has to do is to point out that, yes, you know, Paul Ryan uh, might be someone who comes from a balanced district and uh, he might sort of have some bona fides for moderates, but he's also been prone to sort of make things up as he goes along during this campaign so far. And so we'll see how badly that comes back to hurt Didn't him. Didn't hurt Romney to make things up, did it? <laughs> it's better than using, you know, race baiting with getting our people back.
back in chains and things that Joe Biden has been doing. I mean, let's, I mean, of all the gaffes that Paul Ryan may or may not have made, the things that Joe Biden have done have been by far worse. But I think that there's a real question to be had about whether or not, I mean, going to Joe Biden's point, he was making a valid question. Look, did he use provocative language? Yes. But if you talk to people of color in this country, they're very concerned about Republican policy. I think that, you know, one of the conversations that we've been having in the course of this election is why is it that this Republican Party seems to be making so few inroads with, with voters of color? And so certainly, Joe, race certainly, is well, that. I mean, you can call it race baiting. Let me, but let me take it back to the was, debate. The first uh, job for both, <laughs> <laughs> first do no harm, okay? Yeah. No major gaffes that are going to harm you. Vice presidential debates classically have been known for memorable moments. Yeah, yeah but Zvante, do you know of any vice presidential debate that ever changed an election, in your opinion? Uh, you know, I, I could draw on history as somebody who uh, has special empathy for Congressman Ryan. Anytime there's the youngest candidate in the race, my heart does go out to them. So I, I can't remember, you know, I only remember ever watching a handful of vice presidential debates. But of course, uh, the debate with Dan Quayle, where his opponent said, uh, after he, he compared himself once again to John Kennedy, he said, listen, uh, I, I knew John Kennedy, I served with John Kennedy, and you, sir, I know John Kennedy. Of course, that's, a, that's an absolute killer. Um, but Quayle, but uh, uh, Bush Quayle won the, won the, the election. That's true. I, I, I can't imagine, a, I can't remember a time where a vice presidential debate actually swayed an entire election. But I do think that here, this could be a very important time to stop the momentum that uh, Romney and Ryan have built over the last week from the last debate. So I don't know if it'll win the election, but it may stop uh, the tie from turning. Memory serves me correct. Sarah Palin did pretty well against Biden. She did great. Four years yeah. ago, right? She did great with her winking and nodding and smiling. Can she I did call fantastic. you Joe? Yeah, she was she, fantastic. Some of the time she said, oh, Biden. Yeah. Well, you know, people <laughs> yes. overlooked a lot with Sarah Palin. What's but it? that helped her a lot. Yeah, it certainly did. I mean, it made her look charming and folksy. It was a great introduction or a continued introduction um, of the governor to the American people. Uh, you know, so... Do you think, Megan, this could, could affect the election of vice presidential debate, have a major effect on the election? Because vice presidential candidates aren't running for president. I, I just think, as Howard said, they need to stop the bleeding. That's what Joe Biden's job is doing. And if he doesn't do that tonight, it's just continuing on this wave of momentum. And it's going to dominate the narrative until the next debate. And I think Paul Ryan, in the sense, I think the debate last week was when Mitt Romney really started looking presidential. And I think this is Paul Ryan's moment to really look like a vice president for maybe the very first time to a lot of Americans, because he is rather new to a lot of young Americans. He doesn't have the same name recognition that Joe Biden does. Do you expect Howard, from a PR standpoint, for Biden to be challenging? I think he's not going to make the same mistakes President Obama did. I expect him to pin Ryan to a lot of his very conservative ideas, I, uh, particularly when in relation to Medicare, in relation to women. I think he's going to try and really use the differences between Ryan and Romney to separate them. There are differences. Yeah. yeah. And I think he's going to call him out on some of the untruths and some of the half-truths that have come out as of late. On a historical po a point right now, though, this is the first Generation Y candidate to be up there speaking, and there's such a generational difference between Paul Ryan and Vice President Biden that I think that'll be really interesting to watch as well. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, Ryan's very telegenic. I don't know if you saw, but just in the last 24 hours, there were pictures released of Ryan working no. out and showing his yeah, arms. I'm not obsessed with that, these pictures. I, I think that he is not to be given short shrift. I think yeah. that for those reasons, he's young, he's appealing, he's smart. Um, I, I think that Joe Biden's work is going to be not to look uh, too old and not to look grumpy or crotchety. Right. Not be mean. You know, and yeah. to not be mean. Uh, oh, for your, you're a young guy, Svante. You're the youngest ever mayor of Ithaca, New York. Yeah. Does, does your heart uh, go a little toward in, Mr. Ryan against the 69-year-old man? Well, I'll say first that, that uh, and I know what you're thinking, no, my arms do not look like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as a young person, yeah, I actually got very excited. Uh, Larry, you tweeted at me tour before the show tonight, and I got very excited. I was going to tell my grandparents, um, but I figured they'd be very confused when I said Larry King mentioned me on Twitter. They'd be <laughs> both impressed and confounded. Um, <laughs> but, 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 you know, honestly, I, I think even though he's a young guy, he, he is, he's in a very tough position now because the Obama campaign knows and Biden knows exactly what it is the ticket wants to do now. 
they're going to pivot hard away from the stances they took before. And while that confused Obama in the first debate, he came ready to debate one person, a different person showed up. Biden knows the game plan now. So yeah. he, he, I do think he's going to be prepared with direct quotes uh, that, that Paul Ryan has said as a congressman and even earlier in this race. And when Ryan tries to pivot, he's going to be able to catch him in those, uh, those moments. Uh, just like Ted Kennedy, uh, Senator Kennedy caught um, Mitt Romney in a senatorial campaign where he said, listen, you say one thing, then you say another, you say one thing, then you say another. Uh, Mitt, maybe you should finish the debate with yourself before we debate. That was the line that yeah. ended Mitt Romney's campaign for the Senate. That's right. And if he could roll that out now, I think it, it'll be successful. Megan, do you think there'll be a key issue? They're going to bring up Libya, right? I hope so. I certainly hope so, because that's an issue that still we haven't had a lot of answers from from the president. I certainly hope that foreign policy is something that dominates um, this debate. Um, I think the economy, I think we're going to be hearing about the economy for the next debates with the president. Medicare. Medicare is going to be huge. Joe Biden's very smart on Medicare. He's very smart on foreign policy. Joe Biden is going to be you know, I'm, he'll probably wear a yarmulke to speak to the older Jewish voters <laughs> in Florida, okay? Tanya, do you like the format of nine ten-minute sessions? I do. I think that, you know, the idea of giving these candidates more time to sit and have a conversation with They're each sitting. other and to sit down and to explain ideas and put it all out on the table in a longer-form format, I think it's great, and I think yeah. it's going to give us a lot of good fodder. I agree. If it comes out even, as some vice president, Cheney, Cheney Lieberman, came out kind of even, if it comes out even, does that put a more emphasis on Tuesday's presidential debate? I think so. I think so, because I think that, you know, look, uh, the Democrats are really, if it comes out even, Democrats are going to be even more fired up to see the president uh, do what a lot of them thought that he should have done in the last debate. Uh, this is, you know, the one and only shot for Joe Biden, and so it's going to put a lot more pressure on uh, uh, about pressure on the president uh, to to move to push the ball forward. You know, the first presidential debate was historical. Presidential debates have not moved the needle four or five points in the past. Yeah. They've moved it one or two points. Except, and uh, uh, Mondale Reagan, Mondale went up six points and tied Reagan. That so, and we see how well that worked that out for him. <laughs> but, um, you know, they have not done this. So a lot of the rules are thrown out the window because yeah. we have the combination of billion-dollar advertising budgets, huge social media, huge audiences for this. And I think this is going to be really interesting because of that and really fresh. And, yeah, the pressure's on next week. If Biden can even get a narrow victory, that's really good for him. What's the mood, Svante, in Ithaca, New York? What's the base there? Boy, you know, we, this is a very uh, progressive town. Uh, this is, in fact, in the 2008 primaries where Hillary Clinton was a senator from New York. Uh, she ended up winning every county uh, in the state, with the exception of Ithaca, that went for Barack Obama. So this is a state that really uh, uh, embraced Barack Obama early. In fact, we had more votes for him on the Working Families Party line than John McCain got total in the Republican line. And I'll tell you, the, the mood here in the last week has been very glum. I was at a watch party for the debate uh, um, last week, and half the party had trickled out before the debate was even over. A lot of grumbles, a lot of moans. Uh, folks are concerned, very worried that, that if this debate and the next couple don't go our way, uh, we may see an election that we thought was safe only a week ago slip, slip out of reach. What have we learned, Tanya, you're a Democrat, what have you learned since that debate about what happened to Obama? Um, what do you I, think happened? Because he hasn't expanded on it except to say he got whacked. Um, I think that a couple of things happened, and the mayor uh, pointed out one of them. I think that the president and a lot of us were expecting Romney to stick to the script that he'd, hear, that he'd heretofore been uh, singing, but maybe that was not a good expectation since he's prone to change the script from time to time. Uh, so I do. I think the mayor hit the nail on the head. I think the president was a bit unprepared for the, uh, for the Mitt Romney that showed up. Megan, were you prepared the fact that he would take a strong stand for regulation of government, for, uh, for the, uh, keeping certain parts of the insurance of the health bill that he was going to keep? 
Uh, don't you think he went sort of moderate in that debate? I did think he went a little moderate, and I think that's a good game plan. I have heard rumors. Politico did an article saying that Tag Romney, his son, is one of the people responsible for this new Mitt Romney. And I have to say, make Tad your new campaign manager, because <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, he's doing a fantastic job. This is the Mitt Romney I knew. I have met personally. This is the Mitt Romney I love, and this is hopefully the Mitt Romney that will be on our Because that president. campaign was not doing a great job. No, he, I mean, I don't want to get too inside baseball for your viewers, but I think his tour, you know, his campaign manager maybe wasn't doing him the best service and nobody knows him better than his family and I think if those rumors are true and that political article is accurate then yes I think that Tag Romney and uh, you know his wife are doing an incredible job. How are you saying you think it's going to be feisty tonight much more than the, fir the first presidential debate? Which was not feisty. One of the one of the president's big mistakes was not calling Romney on his position changes and things that he said. And Joe Biden has never been that guy to sit on the sidelines and be polite. I think the president made a couple mistakes. He was he wanted to play to a tie or play not to lose, and he played it way too cautious. He, yeah. he because of that. No, Biden. Biden's really going to be interesting, but he can't be nasty, okay? He can't no, be Paul, nasty. Paul, Paul, Paul Ryan nasty. can't be petulant, you know? He can't come off looking like the young kid that knows more than the, you know... Can't be the, a smart ass. No, he, he really can't. That's the one thing I'm worried about. Not that he is a smart ass, but I, I think he can sort of come off that way. He has to be respectful. You know, he still is the vice president, long-term politician. 72 million watched the first debate. Do you think it's going to be that kind of number tonight, Svante? I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> well, the Yankees not, are playing the Orioles. It's not that interesting. It really isn't. Uh, and the Yankees yeah. are but playing hopefully, you know, hopefully it'll be above 50 million. And uh, I think all the attention paid in the aftermath of the first debate will bring these numbers up for maybe where they have been in the past. But, but it, generally, you know, it, it's not the same must-see TV. Yeah. Martha Raddatz is a very well-versed. Let's go to Martha Raddatz now and the vice presidential debate. We'll be back after it men who have dedicated much of their lives to public service. Tonight's debate is divided between domestic and foreign policy issues. And I'm going to move back and forth between foreign and domestic, since that is what a vice president or president would have to do. We will have nine different segments. At the beginning of each segment, I will ask both candidates a question, and they will each have two minutes to answer. Then I will encourage a discussion between the candidates with follow-up questions. By coin toss, it has been determined that Vice President Biden will be first to answer the opening question. We have a wonderful audience here at Center College tonight. You will no doubt hear their enthusiasm at the end of the debate. And right now, as we welcome Vice President Joe Biden and Congressman Paul Ryan. Okay, you got your little wave to the families in. It's great. Good evening, gentlemen. It really is an Good honor evening. to be here with both of you. I would like to begin with Libya. On a rather somber note, one month ago tonight, on the anniversary of 9-11, Ambassador Chris Stevens and three other brave Americans were killed in a terrorist attack in Benghazi. The State Department has now made clear there were no protesters there. It was a pre-planned assault by heavily armed men. Wasn't this a massive intelligence failure, Vice President Biden? What it was, it was a tragedy, Martha. It, uh, Chris Stevens was one of our best. We lost three other brave Americans. And I can make absolutely two commitments to you and all the American people tonight. One, we will find and bring to justice the men who did this. And secondly, we will get to the bottom of it. And whatever, wherever the facts lead us, wherever they lead us, we will make clear to the American public, because whatever mistakes are made will not be made again. When you're looking at a president Martha, it seems to me that uh, you should take a look at his most important responsibility. That's caring for the national security of the country. And the best way to do that is take a look at how he's handled the issues of the day. On Iraq, the president said he would end the war. Governor Romney said that was a tragic mistake. We should have left 30, he ended it. Governor Romney said that was a tragic mistake. We should have left 30,000 troops there. 
with regard to Afghanistan. He said he will end the war in 2014. Governor Romney said we should not set a date, number one, and number two, with regard to 2014, it depends. When it came to Osama bin Laden, the president, the first day in office, I was sitting with him in the Oval Office. He called in the CIA and signed an order saying my highest priority is to get bin Laden. Prior to the election, prior to the, uh, uh, him being sworn in, Governor Romney was asked the question about how he would proceed. He said, I wouldn't move heaven and earth to get bin Laden. He didn't understand it was more than about taking a, a murderer off the battlefield. It was about restoring America's heart and letting terrorists around the world know if you do harm to America, we will track you to the gates of hell if need be. And lastly, the, uh, the President of the United States has, uh, has led with a steady hand and clear vision. Governor Romney, the opposite. The last thing we need now is another war. Congressman Ryan. We mourn the loss of these four Americans who are murdered. When you take a look at what has happened just in the last few weeks, they sent the UN ambassador out to say that this was because of a protest and a YouTube video. It took the president two weeks to acknowledge that this was a terrorist attack. He went to the UN, and in his speech at the UN, he said six times he talked about the YouTube video. Look, if we are hit by terrorists, we're going to call it for what it is, a terrorist attack. Our ambassador in Paris has a Marine detachment guarding him. Shouldn't we have a Marine detachment guarding our ambassador in Benghazi, a place where we knew that there was an Al-Qaeda cell with arms? This is becoming more troubling by the day. They first blamed the YouTube video. Now they're trying to blame the Romney-Ryan ticket for making this an issue. And with respect to Iraq, we had the same position before the withdrawal, which was, we agreed with the Obama administration. Let's have a status of forces agreement to make sure that we secure our gains. The vice president was put in charge of those negotiations by President Obama, and they failed to get the agreement. We don't have a status of forces agreement because they failed to get one. That's what we are talking about. And when it comes to our veterans, we owe them a great debt of gratitude for what they've done for us, including your son, Bo. But we also want to make sure that we don't lose the things we fought so hard to get. And with respect to Afghanistan and the 2014 deadline, we agree with the 2014 transition. But what we also want to do is make sure that we're not projecting weakness abroad. And that's what's happening here. This Benghazi issue would be a tragedy in and of itself. But unfortunately, it's indicative of a broader problem. And that is what we are watching on our TV screens is the unraveling of the Obama foreign policy which is making the world more, more chaotic and us less safe. I, I just want to talk to you about right in the middle of the crisis, Governor Romney, and you're talking about this again tonight, talked about the weakness, talked about apologies from the Obama administration. Was that really appropriate right in the middle of the crisis? On that same day, the Obama administration had the exact same position. Let's recall that they disavowed their own statement that they had put out earlier in the day in Cairo. So we had the same position, but we will, it's never too early to speak out for our values. We should have spoken out right away when the Green Revolution was up and starting, when the mullahs in Iran were attacking their people. We should not have called Bashar Assad a reformer when he was turning his Russian-provided guns on his own people. We should always stand up for peace, for democracy, for individual rights. And we should not be imposing these devastating defense cuts, because what that does when we equivocate on our values, when we show that we're Am cutting our own defense, here? it makes us more weak. It projects weakness, and when we look weak, our adversaries are much more willing to test us. They're more brazen in their attacks, and our allies are less willing to With trust With all them. due respect, that's a bunch of malarkey. And in why fact, is that so? Because not a single thing he said is accurate. First of all... Be specific. I will be very specific. Number one, the, uh, this lecture on embassy security. The congressman here cut embassy security in his budget by $300 million below what we asked for, number one. So much for the embassy security piece. Number two, Governor Romney, before he knew the facts, before he even knew that our ambassador was killed, he was out making a political statement which was panned by the media around the world. And this talk about this, this weakness, I, I don't understand what my friend's talking about here. 
We, this is a president who's gone out and done everything he has said he was going to do. This is the guy who's repaired our alliances so the rest of the world follows us again. This is the guy who brought the entire world, including Russia and China, to bring about the most devastating, most devastating, uh, um, uh, 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 the most devastating efforts on uh, Iran to make sure that they, in fact, stop with their... Look, I, I, I just, I mean, these guys bet against America all the time. Mm. Can, can we talk about, can, let me go back yeah, to sure. Libya. What were you first told about the attack? A, why, why were people talking about protests? When people in the consulate first saw armed men attacking with guns, there were no protesters. Because why that's did exactly that go on for what weeks? what we were told by, by the who? intelligence community. The intelligence community told us that. As they learned more facts about exactly what happened, they changed their assessment. That's why there's also an investigation headed by Tom Pickering, a leading diplomat in the, from the Reagan years, who is doing an investigation as to whether or not there are any lapses, what the lapses were, so that they will never happen again. And they wanted but, more security there. Well, we weren't told they wanted more security again. We did not know they wanted more security again. And by the way, at the time, we were told exactly, we said exactly what the intelligence community told us that they knew. That was the assessment. And as the intelligence community changed their view, we made it clear they changed their view. That's why I said we will get to the bottom of this. You know, usually when there's a crisis, we pull together. We pull together as a nation. But as I said, even before we knew what happened to the ambassador, the governor was holding a press conference. I was holding a press conference. That's not presidential leadership. Mr. Ryan, I want to ask you about the Romney campaign talks a lot about no apologies. He has a book called No Apologies. Should the U.S. have apologized for Americans burning Qurans in Afghanistan? Should the U.S. apologize for U.S. Marines urinating on Taliban corpses? Oh, gosh, yes. Urinating on Taliban cor corpses? What we should not apologize for. Burning Qurans for, immediately. What, what we should not be apologizing for are standing up for our values. What we should not be doing is saying to the Egyptian people, while Mubarak is cracking down on them, that he's a good guy, and then the next week say he ought to go. What we should not be doing is rejecting claims for, for calls for more security in our barracks, in our Marine. We need Marines in Benghazi when the commander on the ground says we need more forces for security. There were requests for extra security. Those requests were not honored. Look, this was the anniversary of 9-11. It was Libya a country we knew we had al-Qaeda cells there. As we know, al-Qaeda and its affiliates are on the rise in northern Africa. And we did not give our ambassador in Benghazi a marine detachment. Of course there's an investigation so we can make sure that this never happens again. But when it comes to speaking up for our values, we should not apologize for those. Here's the problem. Look at all the various issues out there, and it's unraveling before our eyes. The vice president talks about sanctions on Iran. They got, we've had Let's four. move to Iran. I'd, I'd actually like to move to Iran because there's really no bigger national security Absolutely. this country is facing. Both President Obama and Governor Romney have said they will prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, even if that means military action. Last week, former Defense Secretary Bob Gates said a strike on Iran's facilities would not work and, quote, could prove catastrophic, haunting us for generations. Can the two of you be absolutely clear and specific to the American people? How effective would a military strike be, Congressman Ryan? We cannot allow Iran to gain a nuclear weapons capability. Now, let's take a look at where we've got, come from. When Barack Obama was elected, they had enough fissile material, nuclear material, to make one bomb. Now they have enough for five. They're racing toward a nuclear weapon. They're four years closer toward a nuclear weapons capability. We've had four different sanctions to the UN on Iran, three from the Bush administration, one here. And the only reason we got it is because Russia watered it down and prevented the, the sanctions from hitting the central bank. Mitt Romney proposed these sanctions in 2007. In Congress, I've been fighting for these sanctions since 2009. The administration was blocking us every step of the way. Only because we had strong bipartisan support for these tough sanctions were we able to overrule their objections and put them in spite of the administration. Imagine what would have happened if we had these sanctions in place earlier. You think Iran's not brazen? Look at what they're doing. They're stepping up their terrorist attacks. They tried a terrorist attack in the United States last year when they tried to blow up the Saudi ambassador at a restaurant in Washington, D.C. And talk about credibility. 
when this administration says that all options are on the table, they send out senior administration officials that send all these mixed signals. And so in order to solve this peacefully, which is everybody's goal, you have to have the Ayatollahs change their minds. Look at where they are. They're moving faster toward a nuclear weapon. It's because this administration has no credibility on this issue. It's because this administration watered down sanctions, delayed sanctions, tried to stop us from putting the tough sanctions in place. Now we have them in place because of Congress. They say the military option's on the table, but it's not being viewed as credible. And the key is to do this peacefully is to make sure that we have credibility. Under a Romney administration, we will have credibility on this issue. Vice President Biden. It's incredible. <laughs> uh, look, um, imagine had we let the Republican Congress work out the sanctions. You think there's any possibility the entire world would have joined us, Russia and China, all of our allies? These are the most crippling sanctions in the history of sanctions, period, period. When Governor Romney's asked about it, he said, we got to keep these sanctions. When you say, well, you're talking about doing more, what are you, are you, you're going to go to war? Is that what you want to do now? We want to prevent war. We're gonna, and I, the interesting thing is how they're going to prevent war. How are they going to prevent war? They say there, there's nothing more that, we, that they say we should do than what we've already done, number one. And number two, with regard to the ability of the United States to take action militarily, it is, it is not in my purview to talk about classified information, but we feel quite confident we could deal a serious blow to the Iranians. But number two, the Iranians are, the Israelis and the United States, our military and intelligence communities are absolutely the same exact place in terms of how close, how close the Iranians are to getting a nuclear weapon. They are a good way away. There is no difference between our view and theirs. When my friend talks about fissile material, they have to take this highly enriched uranium, get it from 20% up, then they have to be able to have something to put it in. There is no weapon that the Iranians have at this point. Both the Israelis and we know, we'll know if they start the process of building a weapon. So all this bluster I keep hearing, all this loose talk, what are they talking about? Are you talking about to be more credible? What more can the president do? Stand before the United Nations, tell the whole world, directly communicate to the Ayatollah, we will not let them acquire a nuclear weapon, period, unless he's talking about going to war. Martha, let's just let's look at this from the view of the Ayatollahs. What do they see? They see this administration trying to water down sanctions in Congress for over two years. They're moving faster toward a nuclear weapon. They're spinning the centrifuges faster. They see us saying when we come into the administration, when they're sworn in, we need more space with our ally Israel. They see President Obama in New York City the same day Bibi Netanyahu is, and he, instead of meeting with him, goes on a, on a daily talk show. They see when we say that these options are on the table, the Secretary of Defense walked them back. They are not changing their mind. That's what we have to do, is change their mind so they stop pursuing well, nuclear weapons, and they're going so faster. Quickly. Look, you, you both saw Benjamin Netanyahu hold up that picture mm. of a bomb with a red line and talking about the red line being in spring. So can you solve this? If, if the Romney Ryan ticket is elected, can you solve this in two months before spring and avoid nuclear... Nuclear. We, we can debate the timeline. We can debate the timeline whether there's, it's that short a time or longer. I, I agree that it's probably longer. Number two, it's all you about. You don't agree with that bomb and what no. the Israelis no. might do. Look, we, we both. Oh, we, I don't want to go into classified oh. stuff, but we both it's, agree that to do this peacefully, you got to get them to change their minds. They're not changing their minds. And look at what this but administration what do, what does. Do you do Let me tell you what the Ayatollah sees. Have to have the Ayatollah sees his economy being crippled. The Ayatollah sees that there are 50% fewer exports of oil. He sees the currency going into the tank. He sees the economy going into freefall. And he sees the world for the first time totally united in opposition to him getting a nuclear weapon. Now, with regard to Bibi, who's been my friend for 39 years, the president has met with Bibi a dozen times. B he's spoken to Bibi Netanyahu as much as he's spoken to anybody. The idea that we're not in, I was in a, just before he went to the UN, I was in a conference call with the, with the president, uh, with him talking to Bibi for, 
well over an hour in, 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 in stark relief and detail about what was going on. This is a bunch of stuff. Look, here's the deal. What does that mean, a bunch of stuff? Well, it means it's simply inaccurate. It's Irish. <laughs> it's Irish. It is. <laughs> we Irish call it malarkey. Thanks for the translation. No, okay. We Irish call it malarkey. <laughs> but last thing, the Secretary of Defense has made it absolutely clear. He didn't walk anything back. We will not allow the Iranians to get a nuclear weapon. What Bibi held up there was, when they get to the point where they can enrich uranium enough to put into a weapon, they don't have a weapon to put it into. Let's all calm down a little bit here. Iran is more isolated today than when we took office. It was on the ascendancy when we took office. It is totally isolated. Thanks, I don't thanks. know what world thanks, these guys thanks. are in. Thank heavens we have these sanctions in place. It's in spite of their opposition. Oh, God. They've given 20 waivers to this sanction. And all I have to point to are the results. They're four years closer toward a nuclear weapon. And I think that case speaks for itself. Can, can you tell the American By the people, way, what's no, no, worse, they another not four war years in the Middle East? To a nuclear they weapon. They're, they're closer to being able to get enough fissile material to put in a weapon if they had a weapon. You're acting but, a little bit like they don't want one, though. Oh, I didn't say, no, I'm not saying that. Let's, facts matter, Martha. You're a foreign policy expert. Facts matter. All this loose talk about them, all they have to do is get to enrich uranium in a certain amount, and they have a weapon. Not true. Not true. They are more, and if we ever have to take action, unlike when we took office, we will have the world behind us, and that matters. That matters. What about Bob Gates' statement? Let me read that again. Could prove catastrophic, haunting us for generations. He is right. It could prove catastrophic if we didn't do it with precision. Well, and what it does is it undermines our credibility by backing up the point when we make it that all options are on the table. That's the point. The Ayatollahs see these kinds of statements and they think, I'm going to get a nuclear weapon. When, when we see the kind of equivocation that took place because this administration wanted a precondition policy, so when the Green Revolution started up, they were silent for nine days. When they see us putting des desperate, when they see us putting daylight between ourselves and our allies in Israel, that gives them encouragement. When they see Russia watering down any further sanctions, the only reason we got a UN sanction is because Russia watered it down and prevented these central bank sanctions in the first place. So when they see this kind of activity, they are encouraged to continue. And Martha, that's the let problem. me tell you what, what Russia Let did. me ask you what's worse. War in the Middle East, another war in the Middle East, I'll tell you or a nuclear worse. armed Iran. I'll tell you what's Quickly. worse. A nuclear armed Iran, which triggers a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. This is the world's largest sponsor of, of terrorism. That's They've the dedicated themselves to wiping an entire country off the map. They call us the great Satan. And if they get nuclear weapons, other people in the neighborhood will pursue their nuclear weapons as well. Vice President We Biden. can't live with that. <laughs> war should always be the absolute last resort. That's why these crippling sanctions with Bibi Netanyahu says we should continue, which, if I'm not mistaken, Governor Romney says we, we should continue. If I, I may be mistaken. He changed his mind so often. I could be wrong. But the fact of the matter is he says they're working. And the fact is that they are being crippled by them. And we've made it clear. Big nations can't bluff. This president doesn't bluff. Gentlemen, I want to bring the conversation to a different kind of national security issue, the state of our economy. The number one issue here at home is jobs. The percentage of unemployed just fell below 8% for the first time in 43 months. The Obama administration had projected that it would fall below 6% now after the addition of close to a trillion dollars in stimulus money. So will both of you level with the American people? Can you get unemployment to under 6% and how long will it take? I don't Vice know President how long Biden. it will take. We can and we will get it under 6%. Let's look at the, let's take a look at the facts. Let's look at uh, where we were when we came to office. The economy was in free fall. We had the Great Recession hit. Nine million people lost their job. 1.7 $1.6 trillion in wealth lost in equity in your homes and retirement accounts for the middle class. We knew we had to act for the middle class. We immediately went out and rescued General Motors. We went ahead and made sure that we cut taxes for the middle class. And in addition to that, when that, ha and when that occurred, what did Romney do? 
Romney said, no, let Detroit go bankrupt. We moved in and helped people refinance their homes. Governor Romney said, no, let foreclosures hit the bottom. But it shouldn't be surprising for a guy who says 47% of the American people are unwilling to take responsibility for their own lives. My friend recently in a speech in Washington said 30% of the American people are takers. These people are my mom and dad, the people I grew up with, my neighbors. They pay more effective tax than Governor Romney pays in his federal income tax. They are elderly people who, in fact, are living off of Social Security. There are veterans and people fighting in Afghanistan right now who are, quote, not paying any taxes. I've had it up to here with this notion that 47 percent, it's about time they take some responsibility here. And instead of signing pledges to Grover Norquist not to ask the wealthiest among us to contribute to bring back the middle class, they should be signing a pledge saying to the middle class, we're going to level the playing field. We're going to give you a fair shot again. We are going to not repeat the mistakes we made in the past by having a different set of rules for Wall Street and Main Street, making sure that we continue to hemorrhage these tax cuts for the super wealthy. They're pushing the continuation of a tax cut that will give an additional $500 billion in tax cuts to 120,000 families. And they're holding hostage the middle class tax cut because they say we won't pass, we won't continue the middle class tax cut unless you t give the tax cut for the super wealthy. It's about time they take some responsibility. Mr. Ryan. Joe and I are from similar towns. He's from Scranton, Pennsylvania. I'm from Janesville, Wisconsin. You know what the unemployment rate in Scranton is today? I sure do. It's 10%. Yeah. You know what it was the day you guys came in? 8.5%. Yeah. That's how it's going all around America. Look. You don't read the statistics. Look, That's not how it's going. It's going this down. This is two minute answer, L look. please. <laughs> Did they come in and inherit a tough situation? Absolutely. <laughs> but we're going in the wrong direction. Look at where we are. The economy is barely limping along. It's growing at 1.3%. That's slower than it grew last year. And last year was slower than the year before. Job growth in September was slower than it was in August. And August was slower than it was in July. We're heading in the wrong direction. 23 million Americans are struggling for work today. 15% of Americans are living in poverty today. This is not what a real recovery looks like. We need real reforms for a real recovery, and that's exactly what Mitt Romney and I are proposing. It's a five-point plan. Get America energy independent in North America by the end of the decade. Help people who are hurting get the skills they need to get the jobs they want. Get this deficit and debt under control to prevent a debt crisis. Make trade work for America so we can make more things in America and sell them overseas and champion small businesses. Don't raise taxes on small businesses because there are job creators. He talks about Detroit. Mitt Romney's a car guy. They keep misquoting him, but he, let me tell you about the Mitt Romney I know. This is a guy who I was talking to, a family in Northboro, Massachusetts the other day, Cheryl and Mark Nixon. Their kids were hit in a car crash Four of them, two of them, Rob and Reed, were paralyzed. The Romneys didn't know them. They went to the same church they never met before. Mitt asked if he could come over on Christmas. He brought his boys, his wife, and gifts. Later on, he said, I know you're struggling, Mark. Don't worry about their college. I'll pay for it. When Mark told me this story, because you know what? Mitt Romney doesn't tell these stories. The Nixons told this story. When he told me this story, he said it wasn't the help, the cash help. It's that he gave his time and he has consistently. This is a man who gave 30% of his income to charity, more than the two of us combined. Mitt Romney's a good man. He cares about 100% of Americans in this country. And with respect to that quote, I think the Vice President very well knows that sometimes the words don't come out of your mouth the right way. <laughs> <laughs> but I always say what I mean. <laughs> and we so does Romney. We want everybody to succeed we want to get people out of poverty, in the middle class, onto a life of self-sufficiency. We believe in opportunity and upward mobility. That's what we're going to push for in a Romney administration. Vice President, Look. I have a feeling you have a few things to say here. <laughs> uh, the idea, if you heard that, that uh, little soliloquy on 47% and you think he just made a mistake, then I think you're, I, 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 I think, I got a bridge to, to sell you. Um, mm -hmm. Look, uh, I, I don't doubt his personal generosity and I understand what it's like. Uh, um, when I was a little younger than the congressman, uh, my wife uh, was in an accident, killed my daughter and, uh, and my wife, and my two sons survived. 
I have sat in the homes of many people have gone through what I get through because the one thing you can give people solace is to know if they know you've been through it, that they can make it. So I, I don't doubt his personal uh, commitment to individuals. But you know what? I know he had no commitment to the autom automobile industry. He just let, he said, let it go bankrupt, period. Let it drop out. All this talk, we saved a million jobs. 200,000 people are working today. And I've never met two guys who are more down on America across the board. We're told everything's going bad. There are 5.2 million new jobs, private sector jobs. We need more, but 5.2 million. If they'd get out of the way, if they get out of the way and let us pass the tax cut for the middle class, make it permanent. If they get out of the way and pass the, pass the jobs, well, if they get out of the way and let us allow 14 million people who are struggling to stay in their homes because their mortgages are upside down but they never missed a mortgage payment, just get out of the way. Stop talking about how you care about people. Show me something. Show me a policy. Show me a policy where you take responsibility. And by the way, they talk about this great recession if it fell out of the sky, like, oh my goodness, where did it come from? It came from this man voting to put two wars in a credit card, to at the same time put a prescription drug benefit in the credit card, a, a trillion dollar tax cut for very wealthy. I was there, I voted against them. I said, no, we can't afford that. And now all of a sudden these guys are so seized with the concern about the debt that they created. Congressman Ryan. <clears throat> Let's not forget that they came in with one party control. When Barack Obama was elected, his party controlled everything. They had the ability to do everything of their choosing and look at where we are right now. They passed the stimulus. The idea that we could borrow $831 billion, spend it on all these special interest groups and that it would work out just fine. That unemployment would never get to 8%. It went up above 8% for 43 months. They said that right now, if we just pass this stimulus, the economy would grow at 4%. It's growing at 1.3. When could you get it below 6%? That's what our entire premise of our pro-growth plan for a stronger middle class is all about. Getting the economy growing at 4%, creating 12 million jobs over the next four years. Look at just the $90 billion in stimulus. And the vice president was in charge of overseeing this. $90 billion in green pork, to campaign contributors and special interest groups. There are, just at the Department of Energy, over 100 criminal investigations that have been launched into just how stimulus go ahead, spends go are ahead, being spent. Martha, look, his colleague runs an investigative committee, spent months and this months the, and months going into this. This is the Inspector this. General. May, months and months. They found no evidence of cronyism. And I love my friend here. I ha I'm not allowed to show letters, but go on our website. He sent me two letters saying, by the way, can you send me some stimulus money for companies here in the state of Wisconsin? We sent millions of dollars. You know why he said You did he ask for stimulus money, Sure he correct? did. By the way, On he, two he occasions, we, had, we, we advocated for constituents who are applying for grants. <laughs> That's what we do. We do that for all constituents who are applying oh, I for I love grants. that. I love that. This uh, is such a bad program. And he writes me a letter saying, writes the Department of Energy a letter saying, the reason we need this stimulus, it will create growth and jobs. He, his words. And now he's sitting here looking at me. And by the way, that program, again, investigated. What the Congress said was it was a model. Less than four tenths of 1% waste or fraud in the program. And all this talk about cronyism. They investigated and investigated, did not find one single piece of evidence. I wish he would just tell, be what, a little more candid. Was it a good idea to spend taxpayer dollars on electric cars in Finland or on windmills in China? Look, was it a good idea to borrow all this money from countries like China <laughs> and spend it on all these various different interest groups? Let me tell you, it was a good idea. It was a good idea. Moody's and others said that this was exactly what we needed to stop us from going off the cliff. It set the conditions to be able to grow again. We have, in fact, 4% of those green jobs didn't go under. When went, went under, it didn't work. It's a better batting average than investment bankers have. They have about a 40%. Right, where are the five million green jobs that were being? I, I want to move on here to to Medicare and entitlements. I think we've gone over this quite enough. And Both, by the way, any letter you send me, I'll entertain. I appreciate that, Joe. <laughs> Let's talk about Medicare and entitlements. Both Medicare and Social Security are going broke and taking a larger share of the budget in the process. Will benefits for Americans under these programs have to change for the programs to survive, Mr. Ryan? Absolutely. Medicare and Social Security are going bankrupt. These are indisputable facts. 
look, when I look at these programs, we've all had tragedies in our lives. I think about what they've done for my own family. My mom and I had my grandmother move in with us who was facing Alzheimer's. Medicare was there for her, just like it's there for my mom right now, who's a Florida senior. After my dad died, my mom and I got Social Security survivor's benefits. Helped me pay for college. It helped her go back to college in her 50s, where she started a small business because of the new skills she got. She paid all of her taxes on the promise that these programs would be there for her. We will honor this promise. And the best way to do it is to reform it for my generation. You see, if you reform these programs for my generation, people 54 and below, you can guarantee they don't change for people in or near retirement, which is precisely what Mitt Romney and I are proposing. Look what, look what Obamacare does. Obamacare takes $716 billion from Medicare to spend on Obamacare. Even their own chief actuary at Medicare backs this up. He says, you can't spend the same dollar twice. You can't claim that this money goes to Medicare and Obamacare. And then they put this new Obamacare board in charge of cutting Medicare each and every year in ways that will lead to denied care for current seniors. This board, by the way, it's 15 people. The president's supposed to appoint them next year. And not one of them even has to have medical training. And Social Security, if we don't shore up Social Security, when we run out of the IOUs, when the program goes bankrupt, a 25% across the board benefit cut kicks in on current seniors in the middle of their retirement. We're gonna stop that from happening. They haven't put a credible solution on the table. He'll tell you about vouchers. He'll say all these things to try and scare people. Here's what we're saying. Give younger people, when they become Medicare eligible, guaranteed coverage options that you can't be denied, including traditional Medicare. Choose your plan and then Medicare subsidizes your premiums. Not as much for the wealthy people, more coverage for middle income people and total out of pocket coverage for the poor and the sick. Choice and competition. We would rather have 50 million future seniors determine how their Medicare is delivered to them instead of 15 bureaucrats deciding what, if, where, when they get it. Vice President Biden, too. You know, I heard that death panel argument from Sarah Palin. It seems every vice presidential debate I hear this kind of stuff about panels. Um, but let's talk about Medicare. Um, what we did is we saved $716 billion and put it back, applied it to Medicare. We cut the cost of Medicare. We stopped overpaying insurance companies, when doctors and hospitals. The AMA supported what we did. AARP endorsed what we did and it extends the life of Medicare to 2024. They want to wipe this all out. It also gave more benefits. Any senior out there, ask yourself, do you have more benefits today? You do. If you're near the donut hole, you have $800, $600 more to help your prescription drug costs. You get wellness visits without copays. They wipe all of this out, and Medicare goes, becomes insolvent in 2016, no, no, number one. Number two, guaranteed benefit. It's a voucher. When they first proposed, when the congressman had his first voucher program, the CBO said it would cost $6,400 a year, Martha, more for every senior, 55 and below, when they got there. He knew that, yet he got all the guys in Congress and <clears throat> women in the Republican Party to vote for it. Governor Romney, knowing that, said, I, I, I would sign it were I there. Who you believe? The AMA? Me? a guy who's fought his whole life for this, or somebody who had actually put in motion a plan that knowingly cut six, uh, added $6,400 a year more to the cost of Medicare. Now they got a new plan. Trust me, it's not going to cost you any more. Folks, follow your instincts on this one. And with regard to Social Security, we will not we will not privatize it. If we had listened to Romney, Governor Romney, and the congressman during the Bush years, imagine where all those seniors would be now if their money had been in the market. Their ideas are old and their ideas are bad, and they eliminate the guarantee of Medicare. Here's the problem. They got caught with their hands in the cookie jar, turning Medicare into a piggy bank for Obamacare. Their own actuary from the administration came to Congress and said, one out of six hospitals and nursing homes are going to go out of business as a result of this. That's not what they said. 7.4 million seniors are projected to lose the current Medicare Advantage coverage they have. That's a $3,200 benefit cut. That didn't what we're happen. saying, more people signed these up. are from your own more, actuaries. More, 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 more people signed mm -hmm. up for Medicare Advantage what, after the change. What they're no, saying, nobody is Mr. Vice President, down. I know, no, no, this Mr. Vice President, this I know you're under a lot of duress to make up for lost <laughs> ground. 
But I think people will be better served if we don't keep interrupting each other. Well, well don't just, take all the four this. minutes then. We're not, we're saying don't change benefits for people 55 and above. They already organize the retirement around these they promises. Are, well, are. Let, let me ask you this. What, for those of us. Uh, what, what is your specific plan for seniors who really can't afford to make up the difference? in the value of what you call a premium support plan and others call a voucher. 100% coverage and for what, them. What That's it what we're cost? saying. So we're saying income adjust these up? premium support payments by taking down the subsidies for wealthy people. Look, this is a plan. By the way, that $6,400 number, it was misleading then. It's totally inaccurate now. This is a plan that's bipartisan. It's a plan I put together with a prominent Democrat senator from Oregon. There's not one Democrat it's who endorses plan. it. Not one Democrat who signed Our partner plan. is a Democrat from Oregon. And he said we, he does we, no longer support we put you it, for that. We put it together with the former Clinton budget director. Who this disavows idea, it. <laughs> this idea came from the Clinton Commission to Save Medicare, chaired by Senator John Bro. Here's the point, Martha. <laughs> Which was rejected. If we, don't, if we don't fix this problem pretty soon, then current seniors get cut. Here's the problem. 10,000 people are retiring every single day in America today, and they will for 20 years. That's not a political thing. Martha, That's if a we just thing. did one thing, if we just, if they just allow Medicare to bargain for the cost of drugs like Medicaid can, that would save $156 billion right off the bat. And it would deny all, seniors' all, choices. All, it, it, it has a restricted are not formula. denied. So Absolutely. They are not denied. Look, folks, I, I, all, all you seniors out there, have you been denied choices? Have you lost Medicare Advantage? Because it's working well right now. Signed up? Because Vice President Biden, let, let, let me ask you. If it, if it could help solve the problem, why not very slowly raise the Medicare eligibility age by two years, as Congressman Ryan suggests? Look, I was there when we did that with Social Security in 1983. I was one of eight people sitting in the room that included Tip O'Neill negotiating with uh, President Reagan. We all got together, and everybody said, as long as everybody's in the deal, Everybody's in the deal, and everybody is making some sacrifice. We can find a way. We made the system solvent to 2033. We will not, though, be part of any voucher plan eliminating it. The voucher says, Mom, when you're, 50, when you're 65, go out there, shop for the best insurance you can get. You're out of Medicare. You can buy back in if you want with this voucher, which will not keep pace will not keep pace with health care costs. Because if it did keep pace with health care costs, there would be no savings. That's why they go the voucher. They, we will be no part of a voucher program or the privatization of Social Security. A voucher is you go to your mailbox, get a check, and buy something. Nobody's proposing that. Here, Barack Obama, four years ago, running for president, said, if you don't have any fresh ideas, use stale tactics to scare voters. If you don't have a good record to run on, paint your opponent as someone people should run from. I Make a big fact You were one of the few ideas. lawmakers to stand with President Bush when he was seeking to partially privatize Social Security. For younger people, what we said then, okay. and what I've always agreed, is let younger Americans have a voluntary choice of making their money work faster for them within the Social Security system. You saw That's not well what that Mitt Romney's proposing. What we're saying is no changes for anybody 55 and what above. What Mitt Romney is proposing. And then the kinds of changes we're talking about for younger people like myself is don't increase the benefits for wealthy people as fast as everybody else. Slowly Martha. raise the retirement age over time. It wouldn't get to Martha. the age of 70 until the one, year 2103, according to the actuaries. Now here's the, quickly, here's the issue. Quickly, Vice President. Quickly. The bottom line here is that all the studies show that if we went with Social Security proposal made by Mitt Romney, if you're 40, in your 40s now, you will pay $2,600 a year more. You get $2,600 a year less in Social Security. If you're in your 20s now, you get $4,700 a year less. The idea of changing and change being, in this case, to cut the benefits for people without taking other action you could do to make it work is absolutely the wrong way. These, look, these guys haven't been big on Medicare from the beginning. Their party's not been big on Medicare from the beginning. And they've always been about Social Security as little as you can do. Look, folks, use your common sense. Who do you trust on this? A man who introduced a bill that would raise it $6,400 a year, knowing it and passing it and Romney saying he signed it, or me and the president. That statistic was completely misleading, but more importantly... That's what they were the facts, this, right? This is what politicians do when they don't have a record to run on. <laughs> Try to scare people from voting for you.
If you don't get ahead of this problem, it's going to attack Medicare you. beneficiaries have more benefits. We are not gonna, we're going to we're gonna move on to a very away. simple question to Medicare you. Medicare and Social Security did so much for my own family. We are not going to jeopardize this program, but we have to save it. You are jeopardizing so the program. You're changing the program from a guaranteed benefit to a premium support, whatever you call it. The bottom line is people are going to have to pay more money out of their pocket. And the families the I own, the world. families I come from, they don't have the money to pay more. That's out why of we're money. saying Gentlemen, more for lower income people and less for higher income people. I would like to move on to a very simple question for both of you. And something tells me <laughs> I won't get a very simple answer. But let me ask you this. I gave you a simple answer. He's raising the cost of Medicare. Okay, on to taxes. If your ticket is elected, who will pay more in taxes, who will pay less? And we're starting with Vice President Biden for two minutes. The middle class will pay less and people making a million dollars or more will begin to contribute slightly more. Let me give you one concrete example. The continuation of the Bush tax cuts. We are arguing that the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy should be allowed to expire. Of the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy, $800 million billion of that goes to people making a minimum of a million dollars. We see no justification in these economic times for those, and they're patriotic Americans. They're, they're not asking for this continued tax cut. They're not suggesting it, but my friends are insisting on it. 120,000 families, by continuing that tax cut, will get an additional $500 billion in tax relief in the next 10 years, and their income is an average of $8 million. We want to extend permanently the middle class tax cut for permanently from the Bush middle class tax cut. These guys won't allow us to. You know what they're saying? We say, let's have a vote. Let's have a vote on the middle class tax cut and let's have a vote on the upper tax cut. Let's go ahead and vote on it. They're saying no. They're holding hostage the middle class tax cut to the super wealthy. And on top of that, they got another tax cut coming. That's $5 trillion that all the studies point out will, in fact, give another $250,000 million, uh, yeah, $250, a year to those 120,000 families and raise taxes for people who are middle income with a child by $2,000 a year. This is unconscionable. There is no need for this. The middle class got knocked on their heels. The Great Recession crushed them. They need some help now. The last people who need help are 120,000 families for another, another $500 billion tax cut over the next 10 years. Congressman. Our entire premise of these tax reform plans is to grow the economy and create jobs. It's a plan that's estimated to create 7 million jobs. Now, we think that government taking 28% of a family and business's income is enough. President Obama thinks that the government ought to be able to take as much as 44.8% of a small business's income. Look, if you taxed every person in successful small business making over $250,000 at 100%, it only run the government for 98 days. If everybody who paid income taxes last year, including successful small businesses, doubled their income taxes this year, we'd still have a $300 billion deficit. You see, there aren't enough rich people and small businesses to tax to pay for all their spending. And so the next time you hear them say, don't worry about it, we'll get a few wealthy people to pay their fair share, watch out, middle class, the tax bill is coming to you. That's why we're saying we need fundamental tax reform. Let's take a look at it this way. Eight out of 10 businesses, they file their taxes as individuals, not as corporations. And where I come from, overseas, which is Lake Superior, <laughs> the Canadians, they drop their tax rates to 15%. The average tax rate on businesses in the industrialized world is 25%, and the president wants the top effective tax rate on successful small businesses to go above 40%. Two thirds of our jobs come from small businesses. This one tax would actually tax about 53% of small business income. It's expected to cost us 710,000 jobs. And you know what? It doesn't even pay for 10% of their proposed deficit spending increases. What we are saying is lower tax rates across the board and close loopholes primarily to the higher income people. We have three bottom lines. Don't raise the deficit, don't raise taxes on the middle class, and don't lower the share of income that is borne by the high income earners. He'll keep saying this $5 trillion plan, I suppose. It's been discredited by six <laughs> other studies, and even their own deputy campaign manager acknowledged that it wasn't correct.
Well, well let's, let's uh, talk about this 20%. <laughs> you have refused, and again, to offer specifics on how you pay for that 20% across the board tax cut. Do you actually have the specifics, or are you still working on it, and that's why you won't tell voters? Different than this administration, we actually want to have big bipartisan agreements. You see, I understand that. Do you have the specifics? Do you have the math? Do you know exactly what you're doing? The Republican look, Congress. <laughs> look, at what Mitt Ro look at what Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill did. They worked together out of a framework to lower tax rates and broaden the base, and they worked together to fix that. What we're saying is, here's our framework. Lower tax rates 20%. We raise about $1.2 trillion through income taxes. We forego about $1.1 trillion in loopholes and deductions. And so what we're saying is, deny those loopholes and deductions to higher income taxpayers so that more of their income is taxed, which has a broader base of taxation, so we can lower tax rates across the board. Now, here's why I'm saying this. What we're saying is here's the framework. I hope I'm going to get time to respond we to this. Want to I, I, you'll Congress. get time. We want to work with Congress on how best to achieve this. That means successful. Look, No specific. Mitt, again. What we're saying <laughs> is lower tax rates 20%, start with the wealthy, Work with Congress and to do it. you guarantee this math will add up? Absolutely. Six studies have guaranteed. Six studies have verified that this math adds up. But Vice President Biden. Look, Look, Vice President Biden. Let me translate. Let, let me have a chance to translate. I'll come back in a second then, right? First of all, I was there when Ronald Reagan tax breaks. When he gave specifics to what he was going to cut. No, number one, in terms of tax expenditures. Mm -hmm. Number two, 97% of the small businesses in America pay less, make less than $250,000. Let me tell you who some of those other small businesses are. Hedge funds that make six, eight hundred million dollars a year. That, that's what they count as small businesses because they're passed through. Let's look at how sincere they are. Ronald, I mean, excuse me, uh, Governor Romney on 60 min Minutes, I guess it was about 10 days ago, was asked, Governor, you pay 14% on $20 million. Someone making $50,000 pays more than that. Do you think that's fair? He said, oh, yes, that's fair. That's fair. This is, and they're going to talk about, you think these guys are going to go out there and cut those loopholes? The loophole, the biggest loophole they take advantage of is the carried interest loophole and, and capital gains loophole. They exempt that. Now, there's not enough. The reason why the AEI study, the American Enterprise Institute study, the Tax Policy Center study, the reason they all say it's going to taxes go up in the middle class, the only way you can find $5 trillion in loopholes is cut the mortgage deduction for middle class people, cut the health care deduction for middle class people, take away their ability to get a tax break to send their kids to college. That's why they is arrive. Is he wrong at, about that? He is wrong about that. There, you, can, that? you can cut tax rates by 20%. And still preserve these important preferences for middle class taxpayers. Not mathematically it, possible. It, it is mathematically possible. It's been done before. It's precisely <laughs> what we're proposing. It has never been done before. It's been done a couple of times. Actually. It has never Jack been Jack Kennedy done lowered tax rates, increased growth. Ronald oh, Reagan. Oh, now you're Jack Kennedy. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> Republicans and Democrats. Republicans and Democrats have worked together on this. You'll That's understand right. you guys aren't used but to doing bipartisan deals. But we told each other what we're going to do. When we did Republicans it with Reagan, and Democrats, he said, here, here are the things we said, we're going to cut. Framework. Let's work together said. to fill in the details. That's exactly the details. That's how you get things done. You work with There's, Congress. Look, let me say it this way. Mitt that's Romney coming from governor. the Republican Congress working Mitt, bipartisanly? Mitt Romney. 7% rating? Mitt Romney oh. was governor of Massachusetts, where 87% of the legislators he served with were Democrats. He didn't demonize them. He didn't demagogue them. He met with those party leaders every week. <laughs> he reached across the aisle. He didn't compromise principles. And you he saw found common happened. ground, and he balanced the budget. You saw it. If he, he did such a great job, job if he did such a great job in four times without raising taxes. Why isn't he even contesting Massachusetts? Vice President, what, what, what would you Isn't suggest? It? What would you suggest beyond raising taxes on the wealthy that would substantially reduce Not the Just let the taxes expire like they're supposed to on those millionaires. We don't, we can't afford $800 billion going to people making a minimum of a million dollars. They do not need it, Martha. Those 120,000 families make $8 million a year. Middle class people need the help. Why does my friend cut out the tuition tax credit for them? Why does he go after can the child care? Can you declare anything off Why limits? Why do they Can, can do you that? declare anything off limits? Yeah, we're saying closed loopholes on high interest people. Home mortgage deduction. For higher income people. Here. Can you guarantee this, that no one taxes, making less than $100,000 will have a mortgage, this, mortgage deduction impacted? 
This taxes Guaranteed. a million small businesses. He keeps trying to make you think that it's just some movie star or hedge fund guy. 97% of the small businesses make less than $250,000 a year would not be you know affected. You know it hits day. a million people. This taxes a million people? A million small Does businesses? Does it tax 97% of the American businesses? It, it tax businesses? a million small, small businesses? businesses who are our greatest job creators. I wish I could get it. The greatest job creators. And you're going, going to increase the think defense about budget. Way. And you're going to increase... The defense no, we're just budget. not going to cut the defense budget like they're, they're proposing. They said two billion dollars. That's $2 not trillion accurate. Dollars. We're More talking than that. about no, preventing. so no massive. No, we're saying defense don't, increase. Okay, you want to get into defense now? Let, yes, I All do. Right. I do. So because that's another math question. Right. Okay. How do you do that? So they proposed a 478 billion dollar cut to defense to begin with. Now we have another 500 billion dollar cut to defense that's lurking on the horizon. They insisted upon that cut being involved in the debt negotiations. Let, let, and so now we let's have a one Let's put the automatic cut. defense cuts aside. Right. Okay. okay? okay. So let's put like those aside. No one that. wants okay. that. But I want to know how you do the math and have this increase in Two defense trillion spending. Two trillion dollars. You, you don't cut defense by a trillion dollars. That's what we're talking about. And the, what, what national security issues Who's justify an increase? We're going to cut 80,000 soldiers, 20,000 Marines, 120. Cargo planes. We're going to push the joint strike Drawing fighter down out. We're cutting missile more, defense. And one more. If these cuts go through, through, our navy will be the smallest it has, it, the smallest it has been since before <sighs> World War One. This invites weakness. Look, do we believe in peace through strength? You bet we do, and that means you don't impose these devastating cuts on our military. So we're saying, don't cut the military by a trillion dollars. Not increase it by a trillion, don't cut it by a trillion dollars. Quickly, Vice President Biden, on this, Look, I want to move on. We don't cut it. And I might add, this so-called, I know we don't want to use the fancy word, sequester this automatic cut, that was part of a debt deal that they asked for. And let me tell you what my friend said at a press conference announcing his support of the deal. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, we've been looking for this moment for a long time. Can, Can I, I tell you what that meant? We've been looking for bipartisanship for a long time. And so the bipartisanship is what he voted for, the automatic cuts in defense if they didn't act. And beyond that, they asked for another. Look, the military says we need a smaller, leaner army. We need more special forces. We need, we don't need more M1 tanks. What we need is more UAVs. Some of the military, I know that's something Not you some support. of the military. That was the decision of the Joint Chiefs of Staff recommended to us and agreed to by the president. Who answered that are the a facts. civilian leader? They made the recommendation first. Okay, let's move on to Afghanistan. Uh, can I get into that I'd like to move on to Afghanistan, okay. please. And that's one of the biggest expenditures this country has made in dollars and, more importantly, in lives. We just passed the sad milestone of losing 2,000 U.S. troops there in this war. More than 50 of them were killed this year by the very Afghan forces we are trying to help. Now, we've reached the recruiting goal for Afghan forces. We've degraded al-Qaeda. So tell me, why not leave now? What more can we really accomplish? Is it worth more American lives? We don't want to lose the gains we've gotten. We want to make sure that the Taliban does not come back in and give al-Qaeda a safe haven. We agree with the administration on their 2014 transition. Look, when I think about Afghanistan, I think about the incredible job that our troops have done. You've been there more than the two of us combined. First time I was there in 2002, it was amazing to me what they were facing. When I went to the Argandab Valley in Kandahar before the surge, I sat down with a young private in the 82nd from the Menominee Indian Reservation who would tell me what he did every day, and I was in awe. And to see what they had in front of them, and then to go back there in December, to go throughout Hellman with the Marines to see what they had accomplished, it's nothing short of amazing. What we don't want to do is lose the gains we've gotten. Now, we've disagreed from time to time on a few issues. We would have more likely taken into account the recommendations from our commanders, General Petraeus, Admiral Mullen, on troop levels throughout this year's fighting season. We've been skeptical about negotiations with the Taliban, especially while they're shooting at us. But we want to see the 2014 transition be successful. And that means we want to make sure our commanders have what they need to make sure that it is successful so that this does not once again become a launching pad for terrorists. Vice Martha, President Biden. Let's keep our eye on the ball. The reason I've been in and out of Afghanistan and Iraq 20 times. I've been up in the Konar Valley. I've been throughout that whole country, mostly in a helicopter and sometimes in a vehicle. 
Um, the fact is, we went there for one reason, to get those people who killed Americans, Al-Qaeda. We decimated Al-Qaeda Central. We have eliminated Osama bin Laden. That was our purpose. And in fact, in the meantime, what we said we would do, we would help train the Afghan military. It's their responsibility to take over their own security. That's why with 50, 49 of our allies in Afghanistan, we've agreed on a gradual drawdown, so we're out of there by the year 20, in the year 2014. My friend and the governor say it's based on conditions, which means it depends. It does not depend for us. It is the responsibility of the Afghans to take care of their own security. We have trained over 315,000, mostly without incident. There have been more than two dozen cases of green on blue where Americans have been killed. If we do not, if the, if the measures the military has taken do not take hold, we will not go on joint patrols. We will not train in the field. We'll only train in the, uh, in the army bases that exist there. But we are leaving. We are leaving in 2014, period. And in the process, we're going to be saving over the next 10 years another $800 billion. We've been in this war for over a decade. The obje primary objective is almost completed. Now all we're doing is putting the Kabul government in a position to be able to maintain their own security. It's their responsibility, not America's. What, what conditions could justify staying, Congressman Ryan? We don't want to stay. We want, look, one of my best friends in Janesville, a uh, reservist, is at a forward operating base in eastern Afghanistan right now. Our wives are best friends, our daughters are best friends. I want, I want him and all of our troops to come home as soon and safely as possible. We want to make sure that 2014 is successful. That's why we want to make sure that we give our commanders what they say they need to make it successful. We don't want to extend beyond 2014. That's the point we're making. You know, if it was just this, I feel like we would, we would be able to call this a success, but it's not. What we are witnessing as we turn on our television screens these days is the absolute unraveling of the Obama foreign policy. Problems are growing at home, but, job, but problems are growing abroad, but jobs aren't growing here at home. Let me go back to this. He says we're absolutely leaving in 2014. You're saying that's not an absolute, but you won't talk you about what conditions would justify. Do you know why we say that? I'd like because to we why. don't want to broadcast to our enemies, put a date on your calendar, wait us out, and then come back. But you we agree want to with the sure. timeline. We do, agree. we do agree with the timeline and the transition. But what, we, what, what any administration will do in 2013 is assess the situation to see how best to complete this timeline. We, what we will do not want to do in 2014. What we do not want to do is give our allies reason to trust us less and our enemies more. In, we don't want to embolden our enemies to hold and wait out for us and then take over the Martha, country. that's a bizarre statement. That's why we statement. want to make sure. No, that's, that's a bizarre why we want to make statement. Sure sense. That this, 49 that this, of our allies, hear me. 49 of our allies signed on to this position. And we're reading that they want to 49. 49 of our allies said out in 2014. It's the responsibility of the Afghans. Do we you, have other responsibilities. Do you think this timeline, but we have, we have soldiers and Marines, we have Afghan forces murdering our forces over there. The Taliban is, do you think, taking advantage of this timeline? Look, the Taliban, what we found out, and we, you, you saw it in Iraq, Martha, unless you set a timeline, Baghdad in the case of Iraq and, and uh, uh, Kabul in the case of Afghanistan will not step up. They're happy to let us continue to do the job. International security forces do the job. The only way they step up is say, fellas, we're leaving. We've trained you. Step up. Step up. Let, let me, let me go That's back the only to, way it works. Let me go back to the, the surge troops that we put in there. And, and you brought this up, Congressman Ryan. I have talked to a lot of troops. I've talked to senior officers who were concerned that the surge troops were pulled out during the fighting season. And some of them saw that as a political, as a political move. 
So can you tell me, Vice President Biden, what was the military reason for bringing those surge troops home? Before the military the fighting reason for bringing those, by the way, when the president announced the surge, you'll remember, Martha, he said the surge will be out by the end of the summer. The military said the surge will be out. Nothing political about this. Before the surge occurred, so you be a little straight with me here, too. Before the surge occurred, we said they'll be out by the end of the summer. That's what the military said. The reason for that is... The military you, follows orders. They, I mean, there, trust me, there are people sure who are concerned about pulling out. There are on people the that are concerned, but not the Joint Chiefs. That was their recommendation in the Oval Office to the President of the United States of America. I sat there. I'm sure you'll find someone who disagrees with the Pentagon. I'm positive you'll find that within the military. But that's not the case here. And secondly, the reason why the military said that is you cannot wait and have a cliff. It takes, you know, months and months and months to draw down forces. Let me, bring some, let me try wait. and illustrate the, the issue here, uh, because I think this can get a little confusing. Um, We've all met with General Allen and General Scaparotti in Afghanistan to talk about fighting seasons. Here's the way it works. The mountain pass is filling with snow. The Taliban and the terrorists and the Akani and the Kedeshura come over from Pakistan to fight our men and women. When it fills in with snow, they can't do it. That's what we call fighting seasons. In the warm months, fighting gets really high. In the winter, it goes down. And so when Admiral Mullen and General Petraeus came to Congress and said, if you pull these people out before the fighting season is end, it puts people more at risk. That's the problem. Yes, we drew 22,000 troops down last month, but the remaining troops that are there who still have the same mission to prosecute, counterinsurgency, are doing it with fewer people. That makes them less safe. Season. We're sending fewer people out in all these hotspots to do the same job that they were supposed to do a month ago, because we but we took 22,000 people we out turned for them to do over it. to the Afghan troops we trained. No one got pulled out that didn't get filled in by trained Afghan personnel. And he's, confl he's, uh, he's conflating two issues. The fighting season that Petraeus was talking about and former Ar and Admiral Mullen was the fighting season this spring. That's what he was talking about. We did not we did not pull them out. The calendar works the same every year. <laughs> it does work the same every year. And we're Spring, not summer, there. fall. <laughs> it's warm or it's not. They're still fighting us. They're still coming over the passes. They're, they're still coming in to Zabul, to Kunar, to all of these areas. But we are sending fewer people to the front to fight them. And that that's makes right, safe. because Let, that's the Afghan responsibility. We've <clears throat> trained them. Not in the east. Let's move. Let's move to another war. Not in the east. Why RC you, East. RC East. RC East, the most dangerous place. That's in the why. World. That's why we don't want to send fewer people. That's, to do the that's job. why we should send Americans in to do the job instead of the. You'd rather Americans be going in no, doing the job. We instead are of the already train. sending Americans to do the job, no. but fewer of them. That's that, the whole. That's point. right. We're sending in more Afghans to do the job. Afghans to do the job. Let's move to another war. The civil war in Syria. Where there are estimates that more estimates that more than 25,000, 30,000 people have now been killed. In March of last year, President Obama explained the military action taken in Libya by saying it was in the national interest to go in and prevent further massacres from occurring there. So why doesn't the same logic apply in Syria? It's Vice a different President country. Biden. It's a different country. It is five times as large geographically. It has one-fifth the population, that is Libya, one-fifth the population, five times as large geographically. It's in a part of the world where you're not going to see whatever would come from that war. It seep into a regional war. You are in a country that is heavily populated, in the midst of the most dangerous area in the world, and in fact, if in fact it blows up and the wrong people gain control, it's going to have impact on the entire region, causing potentially regional wars. We are working hand and glove with the Turks, with the Jordanians, with the Saudis, and with all the people in the region. 
attempting to identify the people who deserve the help so that when Assad goes, and he will go, there will be a legitimate government that follows on, not an al-Qaeda-sponsored government that follows on. And all this loose talk of my friend Governor Romney and the congressman about how we're going to do, we could do so much more in there. What more would they do other than put American boots in the ground? The last thing America needs is to get in another ground war in the Middle East, requiring tens of thousands, if not well over 100,000 American forces. That, they are the facts. They are the facts. Now, every time the governor is asked about this, he doesn't say any, he, said, he, uh, 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 he goes up with a whole lot of uh, um, verbiage, but when he gets pressed, he says, no, he would not do anything different than we are doing now. Are they proposing putting American troops in the ground? putting American aircraft in the airspace? Is that what they're proposing? If they do, they should speak up and say so. But that's not what they're saying. We are doing it exactly like we need to do to identify those forces who, in fact, will provide for a stable government and not cause a regional Sunni-Shia war when, Basad, when Bashir Assad falls. Congressman Ryan. Nobody is proposing to send troops to Syria, American troops. Now, let me say it this way. How would we do things differently? We wouldn't refer to Bashar Assad as a reformer when he's killing his own civilians with his Russian-provided weapons. We wouldn't be outsourcing our foreign policy to the United Nations, giving Vladimir Putin veto power over our efforts to try and deal with this issue. He's vetoed three of them. Hillary Clinton went to Russia to try and convince them not to do so. They thwarted her efforts. She said they were on the wrong side of history. She was right about that. This is just one more example of how the Russia reset's not working. And so where are we? After international pressure mounted, then President Obama said Bashar Assad should go. It's been over a year. The man has slaughtered tens of thousands of his own people, and more foreign fighters are spilling into this country. So the longer this has gone on, the more people Groups like Al-Qaeda are going in. We could have more easily identified the Free Syrian Army, the Freedom Fighters, working with our allies, the Turks, the Qataris, the Saudis, had we had a better plan in place to begin with working through our allies. But no, we waited for Kofi Annan to try and come up with an agreement through the UN. That bought Bashar Assad time. We gave Russia veto power over our efforts through the UN and meanwhile, about 30,000 Syrians are dead. What would my friend do differently? If you notice, he never answers the question. No, I would, I, we would not be going through the UN on all of these things. You don't go through the UN. We are in the process now and have been for months in making sure that help, humanitarian aid, as well as other aid and training is getting to those forces that we believe, the Turks believe, the Jordanians believe, the Saudis believe, are the free forces inside of Syria. That is underway. Our allies were all on the same page, NATO as well as our Arab allies, in terms of trying to get a settlement. That was their idea. We're the ones that said enough. With regard to the reset not working, the fact of the matter is that Russia has a different interest in Syria than we do, and that's not in our interest. What happens if Assad does not fall? Congressman Ryan, what happens to the region? What happens if he hangs on? What happens if he does? Then Iran keeps their greatest ally in the region. He's a sponsor of terrorism. He'll probably continue slaughtering his people. We and the world community will lose our credibility on this. Look, he mentioned the reset. So what would Romney Ryan do? about that credibility? Well, we agree with the same red line, actually, they do on chemical weapons, but not putting American troops in other than to secure those chemical weapons. They're right about that. But what we should have done earlier is work with those freedom fighters, those dissidents in Syria. We should not have called Bashar Assad a reformer, and we should, not have, we, we should not have waited for Russia to give us the green light. Right. We should not have waited for Russia to give us the green light at the UN Russia to do something about it. They're, they're still arming the man. Iran and is flying flights over Iraq. And the opposition to help, is being to help, armed. To help Bashar Assad. And by the way, if we had the status of forces agreement that the vice president said he would bet his vice presidency on in Iraq, 
we probably would have been able to prevent that. But he failed to achieve that as well. Wait, Again. Let, let, let me ask you quickly, what's your criteria for intervention? Yeah. In Syria? Worldwide. What is in the national interest of the American people? How about what humanitarian interests? What is in the national interest? security of the American people? It's got to be in the strategic national interest of our country. No humanitarian. Each situation will, the, will, will come up with its own set of circumstances, but putting American troops on the ground, that's got to be within the national security interest of the American people. I, I want to read. We're, we're that almost out of time like here. things embargoes and sanctions and overflights. Those are things that don't put American troops on the ground. But if you're talking about putting American troops on the ground, only in our national security interests. I, I want to move on, and I want to return home for these last few questions. This debate is indeed historic. We have two Catholic candidates, first time on a stage such as this. And I would like to ask you both to tell me what role your religion has played in your own personal views on abortion. Please talk about how you came to that decision. Talk about how your religion played a part in that. And please, this is such an emotional issue for so many people sure. in this country. Please talk personally about this, if you could. Congressman Ryan. I don't see how a person can separate their public life from their private life or from their faith. Our faith informs us in everything we do. My faith informs me about how to take care of the vulnerable, about how to make sure that people have a chance in life. Now, you want to ask basically why I'm pro-life? It's not simply because of my Catholic faith. That's a factor, of course. But it's also because of reason and science. You know, I think about 10 and a half years ago, my wife Jana and I went to Mercy Hospital in Janesville, where I was born, for our seven-week ultrasound for our firstborn child. And we saw that heartbeat. Our little baby was in the shape of a bean. And to this day, we have nicknamed our firstborn child, Liza, Bean. Now, I believe that life begins at conception. That's why, those are the reasons why I'm pro-life. Now, I understand this is a difficult issue, and I respect people who don't agree with me on this, but the policy of a Romney administration will be to oppose abortion with the exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. What troubles me more is how this administration has handled all of these issues. Look at what they're doing through Obamacare with respect to assaulting the religious liberties of this country. They're infringing upon our first freedom, the freedom of religion, by infringing on Catholic charities, Catholic churches, Catholic hospitals. Our church should not have to sue our federal government to maintain their religious liberties. And with respect to abortion, the Democratic Party used to say they wanted it to be safe, legal, and rare. Now, they support it without restriction and with taxpayer funding. Taxpayer funding in Obamacare, taxpayer funding with foreign aid. The vice president himself went to China and said that he sympathized or wouldn't second guess their one-child policy of forced abortions and sterilizations. That, to me, is pretty extreme. Vice President Biden. My religion... Uh defines who I am, and uh, I've been a practicing Catholic my whole life, um, and uh, it has particularly informed my social doctrine. Catholic social doctrine talks about taking care of those who, uh, who uh, can't take care of themselves, uh, people who need help. Um, with, regard to, um, with regard to abortion, I accept my church's position on abortion as a what we call de fide doctrine. Life begins at conception. That's the church's judgment. I accept it in my personal life. But I refuse to impose it on equally devout Christians and Muslims and Jews. And, uh, I just refuse to impose that on others, unlike my friend here, the, the congressman. Uh, I, uh, I do not believe that, um, uh, that we have a right to tell other people that women, they, they can't control their body. It's a decision between them and their doctor, in my view. In the Supreme Court, I'm not going to interfere with that. Um, with regard to the assault on the Catholic Church, let me make it absolutely clear. No religious institution, Catholic or otherwise, 
including Catholic Social Services, Georgetown Hospital, Mercy Hospital, any hospital. None has to either refer for contraception, none has to pay for contraception, none has to be a vehicle to get contraception in any insurance policy they provide. That is a fact. That is a fact. Now, with regard to the way in which the, we differ, uh, uh, my friend says uh, that um, he, uh, um, well, I guess he accepts Governor Romney's position now, because in the past, uh, he has argued that um, uh, there was, uh, there's rape and forcible rape. He's argued that in the case of rape or incest, uh, it was still, it would be a crime to engage in having an abortion. I just fundamentally disagree with my friend. Congressman Ryan. All I'm saying is if you believe that life begins at conception, that therefore doesn't change the definition of life. That's a principle. The policy of a Romney administration is to oppose abortion with exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. Now, I've got to take issue with the Catholic Church and religious liberty. You have. If, they, the if they agree Catholic with you, then why would, they keep, why would they keep suing you? It's a distinction without a difference. I, I, I want to go back to the abortion question here. If the Romney-Ryan ticket is elected, should those who believe that abortion should remain legal be worried? We don't think that unelected judges should make this decision that people through their elected representatives and reaching a consensus in society through the democratic process should make this determination. The court, the next president will get one or two Supreme Court nominees. That's how close Roe v. Wade is. Just ask yourself, with Robert Bork being the chief advisor on the court for, for Mr. Romney, who do you think he's likely to appoint? Do you think he's likely to appoint someone like Scalia or someone else on the court far right that would outlaw Planned Parenthood, excuse me, outlaw abortion? I suspect that would happen. I guarantee you that will not happen. We pick two people. We pick people who are open-minded. They've been good justices. So keep an eye on the Supreme Court. Was there a litmus test on them? There was no litmus test. We picked people who had an open mind, did not come with an agenda. I'm, I'm going to move on to this closing question because we are running out of time. You certainly know, and you've said it here tonight, that the two of you respect our troops enormously. Your son has served, and perhaps someday your children will serve as well. I recently spoke to a highly decorated soldier who said that this presidential campaign has left him dismayed. He told me, quote, the ads are so negative and they are all tearing down each other rather than building up the country. What would you say to that American hero about this campaign? And at the end of the day, are you ever embarrassed by the tone? Vice President Biden. Uh, I would say to him the same thing I say to my son, who did serve a year in Iraq, that uh, we only have one truly sacred obligation as a government. That's to equip those we send into harm's way and care for those who come home. That's the only sacred obligation we have. Everything else falls behind that. I would also tell him that uh, the fact that uh, um, he, this decorated soldier you talked about, uh, fought for his country, that that should be honored. He should not be thrown into a category of the 47% who don't pay their taxes while he was out there fighting and not having to pay taxes and somehow not taking responsibility. I would also tell him that there are things that have occurred in this campaign and occur in every campaign that I'm sure both of us regret anyone having said, particularly in these, these, these special new groups that can go out there, raise all the money they want, not have to identify themselves and say the most scurrilous things about the other candidate. It's, it's, it's an abomination. But the bottom line here is I'd ask uh, that hero you reference to take a look at whether or not Governor Romney or President Obama has the conviction to help lift up the middle class, restore them to where they were before this great recession hit and they got wiped out, or whether or not he's going to continue to focus on taking care of only the very wealthy, not asking them to make pay any part of the deal to bring, the, bring back the middle class, the economy of this country. 
I would ask him to take a look at whether the President of the United States has acted wisely in the use of force and whether or not the slipshod comments being made by my, my friend, or by Governor Romney uh, serve, uh, serve our interests very well. Um, but uh, there are things that have been said in campaigns that I, uh, I find uh, not very appealing. Congressman Ryan. First of all, I'd thank him to his service to our country. Second of all, I'd say we are not going to impose these devastating cuts on our military, which compromises their mission and their safety. And then I would say you have a president who ran for president four years ago, promising hope and change, who has now turned his campaign into attack, blame, and defame. You see, if you don't have a good record to run on, then you paint your opponent as someone to run from. That was what President Obama said in 2008. That's what he's doing right now. Look at all the string of broken promises. If you like your health care plan, you can keep it. Try telling that to the 20 million people who are projected to lose their health insurance if Obamacare goes through, or the 7.4 million, 7 million seniors who are going to lose it. Or remember when he said this, I guarantee if you make less than $250,000, your taxes won't go up. Of the 21 tax increases in Obamacare, 12 of them hit the middle class. Or remember when he said health insurance premiums will go down $2,500 per family per year, they've gone up $3,000 and they're expected to go up another $2,400. Or remember when he said, I promise by the end of my first term I'll cut the deficit in half in four years. We've had four budgets, $4 trillion deficits. A debt crisis is coming. We can't keep spending and borrowing like this. We can't keep spending money we don't have. Leaders run to problems to fix problems. President Obama has not even put a credible plan on the table in any, any of his four years to deal with this debt crisis. I passed two budgets to deal with this. Mitt Romney's put ideas on the table. We've got to tackle this debt crisis before it tackles us. The president likes to say he has a plan. He gave a speech. We asked his budget office, can we see the plan? They sent us to the press secretary. He gave us a copy of the speech. We asked the Congressional Budget Office, tell us what President Obama's plan is to prevent a debt crisis. They said, it's a speech. We can't estimate speeches. You see, that's what we get in this administration, speeches. But we're not getting leadership. Mitt Romney is uniquely qualified to fix these problems. His lifetime of experience, his proven track record of bipartisanship, and what do we have from the president? He broke his big promise to bring people together to solve the country's biggest problems. And what I would tell him is we don't have to settle for this. I, I, we can do better than this. I hope I'll get equal time. I, I, you, you will get just a few minutes here, a few seconds, really. The two budgets the Congress has introduced have eviscerated all the things that the middle class cares about. It has knocked 19, will knock 19 million people off of Medicare. It will kick 200,000 children off of early education. It will eliminate the tax credit people have to be able to send their children to college. It cuts education by $450 billion. It, 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 does, uh, it does virtually nothing except continue to increase the tax cuts for the very wealthy. And, you know, we've had enough of this. My, the idea that he's so concerned about these deficits, as I pointed out, he voted to put two wars in a credit card. He did. We're, we're, going, to the, we're going to the closing but, statements but, 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 in a minute. A I, I, you're going to have your not closing statements. Not raising taxes is not cutting taxes. And by the way, our budget? We, we have not spending raised spending by ta 3% a year instead of 4.5% like they propose. Let, so not spending let, let me, more money as much as they say is not a spending cut. here just for a minute. And I want to talk to you very briefly before we go to closing statements about your own personal character. If you were elected, what could you both give to this country as a man, as a human being, that no one else could? Honesty? Well, no one else could. There are plenty of fine people who could lead this country. But what you need are people who, when they say they're going to do something, they go do it. What you need are when people see problems, they offer solutions to fix those problems. We're not getting that. Look. We can grow this economy faster. That's what our five-point plan for a stronger middle class is all about. It's about getting 12 million jobs, higher take-home pay, getting people out of poverty into the middle class. That means going with proven pro-growth policies that we know work to get people back to work, putting ideas on the table, working with Democrats. That Vice, actually works sometimes. Vice President, and then could we get to that, to that issue of what you could bring as a man, a human being? And I... Really, I'm going to keep you to about 15 seconds here. Well, uh, he gets 40, I get 15. He didn't That's have okay. 40. That's he didn't right. have 40. Now, let me tell you, uh, I, uh, 
my, uh, my record stands for itself. I never say anything I don't mean. Everybody knows whatever I say, I do. And uh, my whole life has been devoted to leveling the playing field for middle class people, giving them an even break, treating Main Street and Wall Street the same, holding them the same responsibility. Look at my record. It's been all about the middle class. They're the people who grow this country. We think you grow this country from the middle out, not from the top down. Okay, we now turn to the candidates for their closing statements. Thank you, gentlemen. And that coin toss again has Vice President Biden starting with the closing well, statement. Well, let me, let me say at the outset that uh, I want to thank you, Martha, for doing this uh, and uh, Center College. Uh, uh, the fact is that um, we're in a situation where uh, we inherited a god awful circumstance. Uh, um, people are in real trouble. We acted to move to uh, bring relief to the people who need the most help now. And, uh, and in the process, uh, we, uh, in case you haven't noticed, we have strong disagreements, but I've, you probably detected my uh, frustration with their attitude about the, the American people. My friend says that 30% of the American people are takers. Uh, they, Romney points out 47% of the people uh, uh, won't take responsibility. He's talking about my mother and father. He's talking about the places I grew up in, my neighbors in Scranton and Claymont. He's talking about, uh, he's talking about the people that uh, built this country. All they're looking for, Martha, all they're looking for is an even shot. Whenever you give them a shot, they've done it. They've done it. Whenever you've leveled the playing field, they've been able to move. And they want a little bit of peace of mind. And the president and I are not going to rest until that playing field is leveled. They, in fact, have a clear shot, and they have peace of mind until they can turn to their kid and say with a degree of confidence, honey, it's going to be OK. It's going to be OK. That's what this is all about. Congressman Ryan. I want to thank you as well, Martha, Danville, Kentucky, Center College. And I want to thank you, Joe. It's been an honor to engage in this critical debate. We face a very big choice. What kind of country are we going to be? What kind of country are we going to give our kids? President Obama, he had his chance. He made his choices. His economic agenda, more spending, more borrowing, higher taxes, a government takeover of health care. It's not working. It's failed to create the jobs we need. 23 million Americans are struggling for work today. 15% of Americans are in poverty. This is not what a real recovery looks like. You deserve better. Mitt Romney and I want to earn your support. We're offering real reforms for a real recovery for every American. Mitt Romney, his experience, his ideas, his solutions, is uniquely qualified to get this job done. At a time when we have a jobs crisis in America, wouldn't it be nice to have a job creator in the White House? The choice is clear. A stagnant economy that promotes more government dependency or a dynamic growing economy that promotes opportunity and jobs. Mitt Romney and I will not duck the tough issues. And we will not blame others for the next four years. We will take responsibility. And we will not try to replace our founding principles. We will reapply our founding principles. The choice is clear. And the choice rests with you. And we ask you for your vote. Thank you. And thank you both again. Thank you thank very you. much. This concludes the vice presidential debate. Please tune in next Tuesday for the second presidential debate at Hofstra University in New York. I'm Martha Raddatz of ABC News. I do hope all of you go to the polls. Have a good evening.
The vice presidential debate in the 2012 campaign is over. It is the one and only vice presidential debate. I'm Larry King. We're at the studios of Aura TV. We have outstanding panelists, and this is our follow-up hour to the debate. You are invited to participate. We want to hear from you. You can leave us your comments or questions or tweet them using hashtag Aura2012. We have a panel that consists of Megan McCain. She's the columnist with the Daily Beast, best-selling co-author of America, You Sexy Beach. I love a bitch. I love <laughs> saying that. A love letter to freedom. And she's the daughter of the 2008 presidential nominee of the Republican Party, John McCain. Tanya Acker is the Democratic strategist, attorney, and commentator. She worked on the 2004 Kerry campaign. Andy Dean, the nationally syndicated radio host of America Now with Andy Dean. He's a conservative commentator and the youngest candidate to compete on The Apprentice. And Ruben Martinez, the award-winning journalist, author, and performer. His latest book is Desert America, Boom and Bust in the New Old West. He's professor of writing and literature at Loyola Marymount University. With us as well, of course, is our uh, good man, uh, David Begno. He's the social media expert, host and executive producer of Aura TV's new social media show, Newsbreaker. And for more information, you can follow Newsbreaker on Facebook and Twitter. Well, guys, one personal note. I have uh, moderated many debates in my time, uh, mayoral, gubernatorial, and the like, presidential in primaries. And I've viewed many vice presidential debates. In a personal thing, this was the feistiest. Uh, I don't know if anybody changed any minds, but each reinforced their points very well. I think if you like Biden, if you like, if you like Obama, you're going to vote for Obama. If you liked uh, uh, Ryan, you're going to vote for uh, Romney. I don't know, this is a personal opinion, if anybody's mind was changed tonight, but certainly your opinions were reinforced. Now the opinions of our panel, and I will get their good judgment. Megan, what'd you think? I didn't enjoy this debate. I just thought it was blood sport. Like I tweeted earlier, it was like crossfire. Greta Van Susteren of Fox News said if she weren't being paid to watch this, she would have changed the channel. I think this is what jades people from politics. I didn't think either of them did a great job, and the smirking from our vice president was, I found, rather offensive. Well, it was smirking on both sides. He was smiling. Yeah, but him smirking is going to be a meme on the Internet tomorrow. You think, or right now, yeah. right at this very moment. I'll get to that. <laughs> but do smirks win campaigns? Lose camp Do you think this affected the campaign tonight one way or the other? I think, like you said, I think if you're already a Romney fan, you're going to vote for Romney. If you're an Obama fan, you're going to vote for Obama. Um, undecided is still undecided. Undecided to flip the channel, change the football game. And I think... No, a football or baseball. You have whatever, I'm not a sports <laughs> girl. <laughs> Open A's. <laughs> A's, Tigers, Yankees, <laughs> Orioles. Tanya, what do you think? I, I agree with you both a little bit. I think that, you know, they both... I, I, I think that Joe Biden did a good job of putting more facts out. I think that where Ryan did not do such a good job is that there were times where he was dancing around questions. Um, you know, to Megan's point, a lot of the substance of the debate came after some of the crosstalk. So I don't know how many people were going to stick around to kind of hear that, uh, get, get some of those good facts out. Um, I think that the smirking by the vice president will play well to the people who already uh, are going to vote for the administration. I think that it pointed out, you know, the disdain that he had uh, for a lot of uh, the, uh, the congressman's points. And I think that, frankly, you know, it made up for some of the president's lack of energy uh, or response to uh, what think, some of uh, Mitt Romney's misstatements were during Andy, the last debate. Do you think, what he was trying to do was be an un-Obama? Yeah, I mean, Obama got in trouble for not responding, so of course he had to overreact, which Joe Biden, but that's Joe Biden's style. I mean, he's not it's a... Joe. Yeah, he's just not like a super bright guy. I mean, that's just his thing. Oh. To me, you know, I thought it was... That. Right. Uh, I think the viewership is going to be low. To me, 20% lower than Sarah Palin's debate because there's a lack of curiosity. But the points I think Paul Ryan scored, because the audience that you need to win over are seniors in Florida, you know, blue worker, blue collar workers in Ohio. Paul Ryan did a good job on Medicare and Social Security entitlements, making the argument for if you're 55 and older, things stay the same. If they're 54 and younger, if we don't fix these things, they're going to fix themselves. We're all going to be broke. You don't think Biden countered that well? No, I mean, Biden was, the, you know, hey, do you trust them or do you trust us? And then he said the word folks a couple times and there was nothing. I mean. The Democrats have not fixed these. They've been in power for four years. Were you, you watching the same Biden debate? think Biden scored yeah. well with women? What's that? If the, well, yeah. the abortion thing always hurts. I mean, at the end. He's Republican. Yeah, I mean, Paul Ryan should have kept his answers shorter, and, you know, that was that was a, a problem. And he could have said he personally disagrees with Romney. On, yeah, I didn't think Paul Ryan handled that as well as he could have. And Professor Martinez. 
obviously there's a Saturday Night Live skit in the in the works right now. Yeah. This weekend, with the, the laughter <laughs> and the faces totally. that uh, the vice president was making. I don't think though it rises to the level of the smirkiness, or the smarminess of uh, Al Gore all those years ago. The the sighing, the, the theatrical sighs. Uh, I think also the vice president countered that uh, the, the the performance, uh, that bad side of his performance, with authoritative. Uh, I, I disagree with you, Andy, about about the Medicare thing. I think he was very forceful on Medicare. I think people have a lot of questions about the Ryan plan, and I think the vice president raised those questions effectively. So I think it balanced out. I think ultimately Ryan had much less time on camera. I think this debate was dominated by the vice president. Uh, David, uh, uh, Dave, David Begno, what's the word over on social media? Larry, if Andy's right and television viewership is low, social media was record-breaking tonight. Two million tweets just since 9 o'clock tonight, and this sums up everything. This, Larry, <laughs> we had Big Bird for the presidential debate. Yeah. Tonight, we have a smiling vice president. Look at this. They already have pictures side by side. As we look at the tweets that are coming in, Eric Stone Street from Modern Family tweeting, Joe's laughing and smirking is probably going over as well with Republicans as Paul Paul's hairline is with Democrats. More coming in from your friend Michael Ian Black, Megan. My He's writing tweeting, partner. Paul Ryan's hair looks more like his mom smoothed it down with her wet palm. Brian Powell tweeting, let's play a VP debate drinking game. Every time Joe Biden grins, take a drink. You'll be drunk in under five minutes. <laughs> Andrea Saul, it was interesting, Larry. As we were watching the debate, Andrea Saul is a press secretary for the Romney campaign. They were already tweeting out YouTube videos of the vice president laughing during the debate, clearly wanting to make the point. Conservative commentator Monica Crowley tweeting, anyone else creeped out by Biden's joker smile? It's weird, inappropriate. Now, and we must understand, when you quote people like this or people on the left, they are not coming as objective viewers. Of this. Twitter, Twitter is not tweeters. meant to be objective. Twitter is, I'm watching it. These, and are, these are totally unobjective. Unobjective, so if opinionated. You're, if you're watching this, remember the source. Absolutely. This is not objectivity. But get a good look at this. Google processing for us tonight. Over the last hour in the U.S., malarkey was the top trending tweet. You might remember <laughs> the uh, vice president said, oh, malarkey, earlier in the debate. Bill Maher tweeting tonight, Biden is hitting it with one answer. Biden is hitting in one answer all the things Obama left out in the entire That's first right. I think minutes. Oh, I think he was debate. being the un-Obama. Very he well. He brought up the 47%. He brought up everything Obama right. didn't bring up, he brought up. And finally, Amanda tweeting tonight, prediction, liberals will love Biden's aggression, independence will be turned off. You agree with that, or I don't know how. I, we, I think Biden I picks up where know. Obama left off. He yeah. wanted to be the cleaner for everything that he didn't bring up. It's just vice presidential debates. When it comes to the actual election, five days from now, we're going to be talking about the second presidential debate. Nobody's going to remember this. Vice yeah. presidential debates tend to be forgotten, right? It don't last long, right? I don't know. Debate. Memes on the internet, ma'am. I just feel like I'm going to see Joe Biden's Joker face all over the internet until election day. I mean, I know election the internet. Day. Joe Biden's a known quantity. I mean, nobody takes the guy seriously. That's I mean, not that's true. Just, nothing you changed know, tonight with that. Uh, okay, enough. A lot of people take Joe Biden seriously. Uh, he is a very smart guy, and I think that he was very strong tonight on pointing out a lot of the flood. I mean, if we want to talk substance, uh, substance, or we just want to talk about the alleged creepy smile. You're both. Um, you know, I don't really trust Monica Crowley's perception about this <laughs> vice president. But, you know, if you want to talk about substance, I think that the vice president was very good on pointing out uh, a lot of the holes in the Romney Ryan plan. A lot of this is math. What will be interesting tomorrow is to see uh, whether or not real journalists and commentators are going to go to the, uh, do the hard work of seeing well, who is telling work. the right math story. I'm sorry, but what about what the, he, the vice president was saying about Libya, that they had no intelligence, no warning at all? I mean, that was something that I had thought had been dismantled at this point, and the president's spokesperson said that Libya was, in fact, a terrorist attack. That, tomorrow, my friends, is going to be all over the news. And him smirking when we're talking about a United States ambassador getting slaughtered overseas is disrespectful. I, don't, I think, and I think it's completely inappropriate to suggest that this vice president doesn't have any respect for uh, the death of Ambassador Stevens. My I mean, father I, I, would I, never I, smile or laugh when talking about Ambassador Stevens being killed, okay. and he was literally smiling and grinning. Okay, when he fair. Was talking about it. But I, I think that to talk about whether, whether or not your father would smile and laugh about uh, this about this subject. Paul when, Ryan one second. The smiling. issue. The issue was Paul Ryan's uh, characterization of uh, this administration's response to Libya. That's what he was.
was smiling at, but to suggest that uh, the vice president was smiling at Ambassador Stevens' death I is don't nuts. I think it's appropriate to smile uh, uh, talking about uh, Libya at respect, all. Uh, Megan, remember also that it was in, uh, the, uh, uh, the, this issue really is, is more about uh, the Romney campaign coming out within hours of the attack without all the facts For and, me, and jumping onto the podium without having and spin, trying to spin a tragedy in, in just a few hours after the attack occurred. What, whether or not they can say this was a terrorist attack or not or what kind of information they had to me is the real scandal and I think you will see a lot of people talking about that we have, tomorrow. We well, have, whether or not it's a scandal depends on what is proven to be a true fact. But and again, to suggest, we're talking, that, to suggest that this vice president does not respect those deaths. No, that is not what I'm saying. She's, 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 she's that is, excuse me, do not put words in my mouth. That is not what I am saying. I am just saying. You're suggesting he was smirking because he didn't take it seriously. That's exactly what you were suggesting. I'm suggesting and you said that your smirking. father wouldn't have done it. And Paul Ryan, I'm just saying I don't think it is appropriate in any context to smile or to smirk or anything when you're talking about an ambassador being murdered. That's all I'm saying in well, any context whatsoever. We have whatsoever. students in the adjacent studio. One of them is Ryan Krebs, a 2012 graduate of UCLA in political science. He calls himself a centrist and a swing voter. He ran unsuccessfully for mayor of his hometown of Moore Park, California when he was 18. Uh, Ryan, what are your thoughts? Uh, yes, Larry. Uh, my question is, do you believe that Paul Ryan has kept the momentum going this week from last week's presidential debate? Good question. Uh, start with, uh, with Ruben. The, mo the momentum issue, uh, I believe, we have to wait and see the, how the trending goes, but I think uh, the vice president went a long way to saying what Obama did not say, what Obama needed to say, and did, you might have did not have stalled the say. momentum, or? I believe that it's mitigated, so took some of the edge off the momentum, yes. Andy? I think it's going to be a draw. I think some people are going to call for Biden, some for Ryan, but I think the point with Megan is talking about. I don't think Joe Biden was you know, laughing at the idea of what happened in Libya. I just think it's a matter of incompetence. I mean, the Obama regime has just been very incompetent when it comes to the well, Middle Eastern policies. Like killing, Bar like killing Osama bin Laden? That's no, quite that was, We give him credit, but it's Dick Cheney's policies no, 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 that got no, 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 no. What Andy just issues. said. What Andy just said was that the Obama regime, uh, maybe that's uh, hosted by his contemporaries King in Kenya, Obama, sure. right, in Kenya, with the fake birth certificate. The, uh, this the, is the like, Obama this regime. Is a, this is Obama, going to a place I'm not comfortable. Well, with, let me finish. The Obama regime, he said, has been had a completely incompetent foreign policy in the Middle East, and I don't think the facts well, bear that out. It's absolutely. I mean, look at Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, who can't get a meeting with the president, and then he goes before the United Nations begging, saying to Obama, "Just set a red line." I mean, the great thing is, if the United States would just step up, if Obama would step up and say to Iran, "Do you want? Hey, wait a minute, you want the United States to say?" Move over this line, and we're going to war with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And what's Iran going to do? You're going to commit troops. Oh well, look. With Iran, you can just fire bomb them from the you air. Think you're going to win an election. Look, it's not about it's not about committing troops. troops. In 1981, there was Operation Orchard in Iraq. 2007, Operation Opera in Syria. They both had nuclear programs that were wiped out from the air. The same thing's going to happen with Iran. They just need to know that it's actually going to happen, and the United States needs to back Israel. Americans don't want that war. Americans have been it's not pulled. A war. It's they an air power. They don't want to get involved. They've been pulled. On this consistently, and all the polls say 70% more or less do not want to go there. One thing that I do want to say, you know, at one point Martha Raddatz said, okay, let's go on to another war, which really made me stop and think, wait a second, how, where, how many wars are we involved in here? How many hotspots around the world? But which one did we not talk about? By we did way, not talk about the U.S. Mexico drug war, which has claimed 80,000 lives. Drugs never came up. Yeah. Do you think Martha Raddatz was very good tonight? I think she I was. I thought she was fantastic. Um, the only thing I wish she had maybe stopped Vice President Biden from cutting in so much, but I thought she asked very good questions. You know, I was worried she was a guest, or President Obama was a guest at her wedding. I just automatically assume there's going to be a bias, but in that sense, you think there's really going to be a bias, and I thought she did a great job. She was on much more on top of it than Jim Lair was. Yes, much more. Poor Jim, poor was Jim Lair. She was, oh, she was running that debate. She was running it. Yeah. Any she was comments asking of, thoughtful, good questions. Hard any questions. Any comments for about her, David? Uh, yeah, Larry. A lot of tweets from people saying uh, Martha really owned the debate. Much more impressive uh, than Jim Lehrer, as you said from last week. We've been tracking the buzz volume. Look at this. Tweets per minute for the vice president, uh, substantively more than Congressman Paul Ryan. What does that Over mean? Over the course of the night, we had more tweets per minute about Biden than the we critical did about, about Biden Ryan. Or praising about Biden. Either or, just if he was mentioned, that was considered a tweet per, per minute. We also were monitoring on the graph from the start of the debate, and we still are right now. 
as the graph grew in people. Start from the beginning. Ryan hammers on Obama's weakness abroad. The chart keeps climbing. As it gets further and further toward the top, look at the blue. Biden really dominated all night when it came to tweets per minute. He peaked right here about halfway into the debate when he looked at Congressman Ryan and he said, so now you think you're Jack Kennedy? When he did that, it really spiked. and He had more tweets per minute than at any point during the debate. It started to drop off as they talked about taxes, Middle East policy, Ryan on abortion. That really dropped off. And interesting when they talked about the, the military, they really hit a low there. It got kind of quiet on Twitter and then dropped off. Let's go to the next point. We're talking about the conversation topics as they happened again in real time. You're seeing this live as we are. Economy, more people are tweeting about tonight than anything else. And look at abortion. This really popping up tonight more than it did in the presidential debate, followed by health care. Iran, we heard a lot about. The middle class, Libya, Afghanistan, taxes, Israel and Syria. And we want to remind you tonight as you are watching us on YouTube, you can also subscribe to our YouTube page. Can't miss the big orange button in the corner. On your Facebook page, Larry, we asked people who won tonight. When we come back, we'll tell you overwhelmingly who people thought won. Governor Romney said about abortion the other day that there's no current bill that he could have a comment on. What did you make of that? I think I agree with you that we should keep as Republicans our abortion stance private. I'm not comfortable talking about abortion in this type of setting and I just think it's uh, the type of issue that's just gonna completely get people on one side or the other and get people angry and get people screaming on Twitter. Very volatile. I just think it's something that never has a clear conclusion. You feel one way about it or you feel the other and people are just gonna start screaming. The only way is who the president appoints to the Supreme Court, right? Yes. The legislation ain't gonna matter. There's, we have the law mm. and either they're gonna overturn it or not overturn it. Right. So that's about, if, and there's if, very little wiggle room for people to go one way or the other. Yeah. But your position, Megan, is the position that uh, would really be telling people to vote for the Democratic ticket. I mean, your as position I said, on abortion. As I said well, the last time I was on this show, my vagina is not the number one issue in how I'm voting. Right. Period. It's arrogant to assume that women <laughs> okay. only care about one issue. I don't well, think we love you, Megan. That's issue. not what no, he said. Just, it's he not. didn't say anything about women only voting for that. So well, don't put words into his mouth. Well, that's then you okay. should listen to the same. I'm comfortable doing that. I know that. I know you're comfortable making things up. Right. Uh, well, was there a was there a gaffe tonight? Um, I don't I don't know I don't, I don't know. think there was yeah. a big I mean there was no big gotcha that I, by other kind of candidate that in I don't certain think so areas who won in what areas? For example, did 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 you, who prevailed on Medicare? You think Ryan? Uh, I mean, clearly Paul Ryan's a serious guy. He's a serious plan to put forward. These programs can't last in their current structure. Everybody gets that who's intelligent. And then Ryan was very clear with the cuts that Obamacare brings about, $716 billion. So he made every person 55 and older say, okay, Paul Ryan makes me feel safe. I'm going to keep my stuff. And every person younger who knows that they're paying into a system that won't exist, hey, at least he's getting serious about the future. So he played it well on both sides. But Ryan voted for that cut. Well, right, but it not Mitt Romney. Because he plays it well on both sides. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> Mitt Romney's plan, that's correct. I mean, Paul Ryan did cut it, but he's not running for president. Mitt Romney is, and he's acknowledged that fact. This moving back and forth across the, the hard right to trying to get to reset to the center of the Etch-a-Sketch routine here, I think that's going to be a big issue for voters. Can they ultimately trust that a Romney ticket will move to the center and govern from the center, or keep on trying to pander to the far right on this? And now let me go to one of our favorite people. He's been with us through all of our encounters here on YouTube. YouTube. This is, you're watching Larry King. I host Larry King now every day on uh, Aura TV, distributed by Hulu, and these are our specials on YouTube. John Zogby joins us, the founder of the Zogby Poll, the internationally known pollster and public opinion leader and the best selling author. All right, John, you hit it on the nail last week with your thoughts on the first uh, presidential debate. What's your reaction tonight? Uh, I'm going to call it even, Larry, uh, but I'm going to score a couple of points for Biden because I think um, it'll show that he, he helped to restore the brand, that he helped to re-energize Democrats. He came out to play tonight. Yeah, I guess you can always count on Joe Biden to do just that. Um, I, I was disturbed um, by his laughter and uh, at times belittling Congressman Ryan. In fact, that's what I kind of thought he shouldn't have done. Um, and I, I, I thought he might do that, and, and he did. Ryan, you know, for his part, I think comported himself well. I think he showed why he's up there, showed that he's a thoughtful guy. Um, but I, I still have to score a couple of points extra 
for, for Joe Biden here simply because uh, of, uh, of the fact that I think he does stop that bleeding. Did, uh, when do you start polling on this debate? Um, we're polling right now. Uh, we're, we're finishing Ohio tonight, starting in Virginia, and then actually going into the field on Monday. Give it a few days to gestate, just like uh, the, the last time, and uh, we'll, we'll get a good reading. There. You've had an extraordinary successful record in polling. What's the latest poll show nationally? Nationally, uh, it's tied. Um, I, I mean, Romney up by one point, actually not even a point. But to give you a context, before the first debate, my poll had uh, Obama leading by nine, 50 to 41. Um, by the time we polled, starting a couple of days after that first debate, that had all evaporated. My poll had it as a tie, 45-45. What, what about the swing states, though? Because with the electoral college system, we know, mm -hmm. that we know where California is going and we know where Texas is going. But where are these seven key states going? Uh, Ohio is a tie. My poll out tomorrow morning has it as a tie. And, you know, before the debate, some polls uh, were, were just uh, saying that Obama was running away in Ohio. Virginia is a tie, one point for Romney. Florida is a tie. It's one or two points for Obama. Wisconsin is in play, it wasn't before. Nevada is in play, it wasn't before. Romney was leading by uh, one or two points in Colorado, one or two points in uh, North Carolina. He's remained there. But there's more states in play today than there were before that first debate. Are you saying that we're gonna be up late the night of November 6th? <sighs> You're, again, I don't know, <laughs> so I'm going to be very honest with you about that. But, you know, we went through Gore and Bush. We went through Kerry and Bush. Look, um, McCain uh, and, and, uh, and, and Obama were playing along, you know, in, in, in September in 2008. So we've, we've seen these close battles before. I think Obama will probably head back into the lead after the second debate. I think it's going to go back and forth. And the honest answer for November 6th is... A is couple like, of key okay. issues. What's the, and I'll have questions from our panel. What's the polling of the Latin voter? Oh, that is hugely for Obama. That is safe and it is secure and it will show up in large numbers. Will they, they turn got, out? Oh, they will turn out. And, and here's how I know. Obama is polling... Uh, surpassing, in fact, the 67% that he got last time. There are few undecideds among Hispanics. When I see few undecideds, that means they're going to turn out to vote. All right, we have a great panel here. Any questions for John? Paul? Uh, Andy? I don't have a question for John. Oh, I, I thought you had a question. question. Megan? Um, how do you think the youth vote is going to come out? First of all, I'm such a big fan of yours. You are a legend among politicos. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, how do you think the youth vote is going to turn out this time? I know they came out for Obama last time. Do you see them coming out in the same numbers? No, I don't, uh, in all honesty. And, and, and actually, we saw a, a chunk, uh, you know, uh, moving in the libertarian direction. We've seen a little bit, you know, you know uh, your father, in fact, got um, uh, uh, 31 percent, 30 percent of the youth vote last time. Uh, Romney may get 35, 36 percent this time. That's enough to hurt Obama. Uh, the potential, imp any potential impact from the third party candidates, uh, Gary Johnson or Virgil Good? Yes. Uh, really? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Gary Johnson, his his total vote is declining. But look, in a, in a race that's one point or less than a point, you know, a few thousand votes here and there can really make a difference in those states. Sure. Uh, John, do you think your polling affects turnout? For example, if someone's an Obama supporter and you show them one percent behind, will that encourage them to go to the polls? Do you think you affect turnout? No, I'm not that powerful. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think we just give a scientific validation to what people already know. You, you know you're in a Nixon-McGovern race, and you know you're in a Gore and Bush race. You feel it viscerally. Um, you know, you get that kind of coverage, not only from mainstream media, but, you know, all sorts of sources. We, we just provide the validation. How important is next Tuesday's debate? 
extremely important. If Biden was able to apply a tourniquet tonight, Obama has got to be very aggressive. He's got to tell his story. If he doesn't, um, he can go into another tailspin. Do you think Obama has to come out then, similar to the way Biden was tonight, much tougher? I, uh, absolutely. Yes, he, he, he does. Uh, Romney is very skilled at what he does. And um, uh, uh, in addition to that, we're seeing a, a, a deficit reduction uh, with Romney in terms of, you know, that personal side. That's coming out a whole lot more. He's becoming much more likable with each passing day. Obama has got to, to stop both of that. He's got to command the facts, and then he's got to tell his story much the way Bill Clinton told his story uh, during the Democratic convention. Thank you, John. As always, we'll see you next Tuesday. Oh, wait a minute. Hold it. Andy has a yeah, question. Yeah, there's one thing I disagree with, John. I think that we're going to know five minutes after the polls close on the East Coast because this will come all down to Ohio. So you'll look at downtown Columbus, downtown Cleveland. If the turnout's high, Obama will win. And then southwestern Ohio is Cincinnati, which has to go for Romney in a big way. So the turnout there is high. The Romney will win. You say and we'll Ohio, know that in five minutes. Ohio, Ohio wins or loses the election? Absolutely. And three cities will determine it. It'll be the Cleveland, Columbus, Can I turnout. Agree and disagree? Yeah, I agree that we'll know when we know Ohio. I just don't know when we'll know Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well put, John. Okay. Adroit. Yeah. <laughs> One of our panelists will be leaving, and one will be will have a replacement. We thank you all for us. Hang right tough. Let's go back to uh, David Begno at the social media desk. Now you're going to tell us who won. Yeah, but before that, Larry, I'm just getting this actually on the phone. This is incredible. Four million tweets over the course of tonight. Three and a half million came in in the first 92 minutes of the debate as we were watching it. So we asked on Larry's Facebook page, who do you think won? Five words or less, tell us. Overwhelmingly, folks said Biden. Check it out. Keith Jones, Joe Biden kicks some butt. Go Biden, questions answered. Biden too hot for Paul. Biden has nice teeth. They love his teeth. <laughs> Women's vagina is not politics. <laughs> Ryan, respectful, prepared, sincere, and direct. Laura says Biden was rude. Joe Biden won. Biden crushed uh, Ryan to death. Mostly CNN viewers I see. Not worth watching and didn't. Biden smirking was disbelief of what was coming out no. of Ryan's mouth. fairness, mom. David. Last week, did we have this many saying that Romney won? Um, no. Well, to a degree. I'm trying to see how much they reflect the nation. To, to a degree. What was interesting about last night is we had even liberal commentators who were so underwhelmed with the president's performance. Even they um, were saying, you know, in a sense, he, he got his butt kicked. But really tonight, people, I mean, overwhelmingly uh, giving props to the VP. Thank you, David. Joining us now, we thank, uh, by the way, Mr. Martinez for joining us, and he is replaced by Howard Bragman, the vice chairman of Reputation.com, our public relations expert. Purely from a public relations standpoint, forgetting your own thoughts, we know you're a liberal. <laughs> How did this go tonight? Um, I think what we talked about before, Biden did what he needed to do. He stopped the bleeding, saw a lot of, a lot of tweets, a lot of Facebook postings. The Democrats are very energized by Biden's energy. He clearly had great energy. He will be called out tomorrow on his smirking. His body language was horrible, but his energy was great. You know, many people in America think this is a junior high basketball game. <laughs> Who won? And it's certainly not that simple. We're, there's going to be a lot of fact-checking on social media, but Biden did a couple smart things. That abortion answer was very damaging for Ryan with the women's vote. And we have to understand that this is a really a, a campaign that will be won by Obama if he wins or lost by Obama with the women's vote, with the Latino vote, with, with many of the minority groups. The moderator asked Megan, is this vitriol, is it going to remain? And what they both thought about it. Do you think it's going to get worse? Yeah, I, I just think it's Both just getting worse so much count. right now. And I just think this youth vote that the Zogby was just talking about not turning out, I mean, we're just killing young voters. They just don't want to come out. They don't want to be a part of it. I had talking to a guy at my hotel earlier today said, why should I be involved? They're just screaming at each other. Things like tonight don't make it any better. Are we, uh, by the way, I'm asking our control room, are we watching people now watching on YouTube Spotlight? Okay. We thank you. People watching on YouTube Spotlight have just joined us. I understand that's a big deal. The little more I learned about the Internet, <laughs> the more I learned. Let's go to Dan Brown, who's a V blogger under the YouTube alias Pogo Bat. He's a contributor <laughs> to Fuse. 
whatever that means. I love Fuse. Uh, you, you're I know fuse. what it is. You're a Fuseaholic. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Dan, what's your read on tonight? <laughs> Uh, well, I think the night uh, went to Joe Biden. Um, I, I think that he did exactly what he needed to do. He was the attack dog. Um, and I think that it kind of sheds a little bit of light on what happened in the first debate. I mean, obviously, the first debate uh, was not a good night for Obama. But uh, I think that Obama had to play it passive. He had to avoid looking unpresidential. And he had to, um, I, I, well, I think that they were trying to let Joe Biden uh, make the attacks first so that when uh, Obama himself attacks Romney in the upcoming debates, uh, it, it doesn't seem like the president himself is the one who is going at his hundreds. Does that make sense? Yeah, let me reintroduce our panel, by the way, for those of you now joining us on YouTube Spotlight. And they are Megan McCain, the columnist for The Daily Beast, the co-author of America, You Sexy Beach, A Love Letter to Freedom, Tanya Acker, the Democratic <laughs> strategist, attorney and commentator, Andy Dean, the nationally syndicated radio host, the host of America Now with Andy Dean, and Howard Bragman, vice chairman, Reputation.com, our public relations expert at the social media board is David Begno, the host and executive producer of Aura TV's social media show, Newsbreaker. Going back to Dan Brown. Earlier this year, you posted a blog on YouTube asking if Obama had changed anything. Your answer was yes. Do you think Obama will get something from this debate? Well, yeah, I, uh, like I said earlier, I think that uh, Joe Biden was able to forward the arguments that Obama himself will be able to parrot. Um, and, and about the blog that I posted earlier about has Obama changed anything, my main sticking point was, you know, the main conservative argument is, oh, what's changed? He promised this, you know, utopian uh, America that we haven't seen. Uh, and, and my main point was uh, he has presided over America during a time of great change. I and mean, we're so caught up in the moment these days, I and mean, we talk about Twitter a whole bunch tonight, uh, we're, we're caught up in literally what's happening in these 15 seconds that we forget. You know, back in 2008, Twitter wasn't a thing. Back in 2008, yes, Facebook was a big deal, but like my parents' generation wasn't on it. Uh, and so Obama himself, just the fact that we could elect someone like Obama after eight years of George W. Bush, um, I, I think says a lot about how the American people themselves have changed over the last decade. So, uh, and I think he's the right person to. I think you speak. A, you speak for a lot of young voters. John Zogby said that the young turnout will be less, and that Romney will get about five percent more than McCain got uh, four years ago. Do you uh, you agree? I think that's probably fair. Um, I don't think that has a whole lot to do with any of Obama's policies. I think that has a lot to do just with the, the fact that you know Obama's not so new. We were used to it. I mean, new things get us excited. Uh, and so in 2008, uh, it was an incredibly stark contrast. Well, I think a lot of kids that are in high school now who are going to be voting for the first time, like I was 18 when I voted in 2008. Um, and I think that a lot of the kids who were you know, 14 back in 2008 or 18 this year, uh, they maybe don't remember how bad things were under George W. Bush, how uh, much the rest of the like world really kind of looked down on. I know. Who is this? I, I'm I sorry. This Can I just all. say something? Uh, I speak yeah. at colleges all the time, all the time. Young people know what's going on, and they're very aware of what's going on with Obama's policies, and they are disillusioned what what he has done. He a lot of them. They don't remember. Well, no, but no, he's he saying we're like children matter. that only care about the sparkly, bouncy thing, the exciting. Well, thing. No, no, that is no, not no. what. That is not. Trust me. I speak at colleges all the time. Kids in their 20s also. Over half of them are unemployed or underemployed, so they look at these presidents' policies. They can't get a job. So yeah, he's the he's the cool guy, but they can't pay their rent and he's saying oh well the president's policies they don't matter one oh, third great. move back in home one third move yeah, back in home with, with their, their parents. parents they have no lies because tanya, do you, we, how, tanya and howard before we get back to david uh, before we get back to uh, dan do you know what young people are thinking um you know i i am not like megan so i know i'm not doing the college circuit as much so and i i i think that you're probably right. I, I don't think it's right to give them such short shrift. But I do think what I do know of what's going on with, you know, uh, that crowd, like I've got nieces and, you know, I, I, I hang out with folks <laughs> like that from time to time. 
Um, I don't think it's so much, I don't think it's just about the president. They certainly aren't as enthusiastic about this president as they were four years ago, but they're not enthusiastic, they're not enthused about the system. I don't think yeah. they love Mitt Romney. I don't think they love this Congress. I think they're really turned off generally. So, you know, I, I do disagree with the blogger a bit. I think that they're clued in, um, but I don't think that they're just like, oh, I can't take this Barack Obama. I just think that they feel really disengaged from the system generally. Well, I think I disillusioned is a word. And I get young people. I, I listen to Flo Rider. I know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> These kids can't get jobs. They can't get well, jobs. Right. And they're upset. They're angry. That's but funny. I'm not convinced these kids <laughs> think that if Romney gets in versus Obama, they'll get a job. I think there's a big disconnect. No, but do you know who I, they love? Ron Paul. Ron Paul, baby, all day long. A lot of Republican conservative well, won't they, students. They won't like, Ron Paul, the Ron Paul voter go to Romney? Uh, that's, I don't know, that's a $6,000 any... question. Uh, the majority, the majority, there's a libertarian Johnson. candidate running, but Gary Johnson, I mean, he's been on my show. He's a weak guy. He's zero charisma. He's a loser. He polls, <laughs> he polls 3%, which is interesting. Third party candidates always do better in polling because people like to, you know, give him a shout out. When it comes to the actual election, they do about half as well. So Gary Johnson gets yeah, one, one and get one percent. But how much of that one and a half percent will come well, from Romney? And I would guess if it's yes. one and a half percent, one percent of two thirds of it will come from Romney. Then, well, and that's something he can't afford. And wouldn't young people, by the nature of the way they, wouldn't young people be attracted to Congressman Ryan? No, I don't think so. I think if you look at the pictures of him working out today, you see someone who's a little out of touch with what uh, young people are into. Because uh, he goes to the, to the gym? Yeah. Because he's got a nice <laughs> body? He he's disconnected from young people because he's got a nice body? Conservatives what, who do you blog for? Like, literally, what are you talking about, man? Seriously, he's hot. I like a hot vice president. That's going to go to some people. What are you talking about? He looks good in those pictures. <laughs> Right? Well, I think I, I have to, you know what? I'm gonna, I will completely. Unobjectively. Unobjectively, <laughs> Paul Ryan is the best looking man Thank in American you. politics. Thank you. Right now. And I look He's like Paul Ryan. Not, so. you're not that cute, though. You think Paul Ryan? <laughs> wow, this is a tough one. Paul Ryan better look. Is Paul, like, Paul, Ryan better, is Paul, Paul Ryan better looking than Mitt Romney? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, oh, absolutely. two women. Yeah, yeah. but Mitt Romney's not... sons are better looking than Paul Ryan's. Mitt Romney's right? got good looking sons. Yeah. He's got They're good They're all married. Sons. Are bloggers discussing? Oh, there we I know have. lots of married guys. <laughs> you, want, you wanted to talk about the hot guy? Here, here it is. So this is the photo shoot happened last year, but it came out today. The timing was kind of yeah. questionable, right? I could have uh, done without now the Now, this, this has already turned into an animation, Larry, on the yeah. internet. They've got him doing like this. And so you can download he it if like you want. looks like Marky Mark. Get it on your phone. Uh, like Tim Tebow. Like, well, yeah, sure. But this is it. This is like, this is what people have been talking about. Larry, you got to remember, look, Twitter is not scientific. Social media is a place where people can go to vent. And everything I've been reading tonight, people love this debate. Say what you want about viewership. Say what you want about disenchantment, if you will. People love this. They actually more, were more fired up about tonight than they were about the presidential debate. They were bored during the presidential debate. We're inviting, Dan, the candidates to come on, the vice presidential and presidential candidates to come on this program. I've had all presidential candidates on when I was in the cable business. Don't you think they should go on the internet? Well, I think they're on the internet to a point. What I would love to see them do is actually engage in video blog conversations because what I love about the medium of video blogging is you can't, interrupt each other. You uh, have time to actually write out and fully formulate your, your ideas, uh, but it's kind of a video by video response format. I would love to see more of that. I don't think we're going to see that this cycle. The but, president uh, did a Reddit ask me anything. That impressed mm -hmm. me. I mean, that is getting seriously that. like That's internet fun. savvy, geeky. I, I love did that. Reddit. I did you it did? two hours. Very impressive. I can't do it. I'm, more, I'm too scared of geeks on the internet asking me Well, you just questions. sit there and they answer the questions. Yeah, yeah but Reddit, Reddit has a, has your a Reddit better was to good, it. Larry. Your I Reddit. did a two hour Reddit. You did a good Reddit. It's impressive. The president did one. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, well, where's Romney's? I think Paul Ryan and Romney should definitely do a Reddit Ask Me Anything. I think it's very important and it holds a lot more I think is it gets But they can't. They can't. Reddit would demand substance. <laughs> and they, as it, we get down unfiltered. to the end, Howard, don't you think they're going to have to do a lot of things? You know, at the end of the Perot campaign with, uh, in, in 92, with Perot, we, we, we got Perot going. At the end of the Perot Clinton Bush campaign, the last three nights of that campaign, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I had each candidate on for an hour and a half. When they saw it was close, it was getting down. I think at the end they're going to be going to lots of places. I think you're going to see them 
in Columbus and Cincinnati and Cleveland and Tampa and Miami. I think you're going to see them shuttling between Florida and Ohio with an occasional stop in Virginia. Nothing Those in Texas, so nothing important. in Montana, nothing in Los Angeles. Frank, <laughs> yes, they will come to take a little money. Yeah. Both of them are going to come here, take the money, screw up our traffic, <laughs> and uh, then they'll leave. Do you think Romney will go on The View? Um, I think he'd be wise to go on The View, and I know the women of The View very well personally, and they'll give him great respect, as Elizabeth did to the president, I, for the most part. And, I, and, you know, on that point, I think that it would be so helpful to him, because what was great, what I think he did very well uh, in the last debate, a, a few things, um, but he really became a little more human and personable, and I think that yeah. Mitt Romney and on The View could really... It's perceived as courageous just by hey, walking into true. the lioness's den. <laughs> Larry, I want to add one thing. I think the moderator did an excellent job tonight. When she didn't get the answer she wants, she didn't get specifics, she went back, oh, and she I was think... very good. I think we saw a big difference between this debate oh. moderation and the yeah. first debate. The first so, way, a lot of yeah. credit. Jim yeah. Lehrer is past his bedtime. I mean... <laughs> You can join our debate conversation on Twitter and Google Plus using the Aura 2012 hashtag. Send us your questions. Tell us what you think. Dan, how do you think it's all going to come out, or is it too soon to tell? Oh, it's far too soon to tell. Uh, speaking more to the social media infrastructure that we have in 2012 that we didn't have in 2008, um, I mean, it's all about what's happening in these 15 seconds. This election could be decided in the last 24 hours. Um, and one social media moment that happened earlier in the year that I think uh, is important to draw lessons from is that whole Coney 2012 thing. You remember that? How yes. did I forget? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and so that, that Coney's still alive. I didn't forget that guy's meltdown naked. <laughs> yeah, right. I didn't forget that. Yeah. He's on Oprah this week on the internet. And the only sure. thing that will kill Coney is military power. The guy's still wandering around. I mean, yeah, I'll never forget that. <laughs> Not well, sure, we can argue the foreign policy side of it, but uh, my, my point is more how that video spread. That got like 80 million views or something in 24 hours. So did Gangnam uh, Style. I don't know what the point, you know? <laughs> they are so good. Well, they are good. Like, I want to get an free trade agreements. But um, <laughs> <laughs> there sure. is the potential for some sort of a uh, massive <laughs> viral campaign <laughs> in the last minute of this yeah. uh, election. So Thanks, Dan. We'll yeah, see you too. Dan Brown. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does early voting going to mean anything, do you think? It's turning out well for Obama in Ohio so How do you far. know? The early voting returns that have been... They have returns that have Yeah, ends? there's... there's I mean, some they early, count them before there's some early The early voting that's happened so far has been trending heavily in the president's favor. How do you know? They well, count them? I, she, I think the, she means the turnout. The, Nobody's seen the, who's I'm voted sorry. for who now. You mean the turnout? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I stand corrected. Yeah, that's okay. That's good. I, that's and natural. early voting, that more. some I, of it actually started before the first I'll debate, and that was good for the president. And people who still aren't sure will probably hold their ballots. All this does is really, really tee it up for the next presidential debate. If Obama does not have the kind of energy he needs, it's going to be in um, deep doo doo, as he's we say. He's got to pick the ball up from Biden. Absolutely, right. he could, he should watch this. There's things he should learn to do, and things he should definitely learn not to do here. Another of our students is uh, in our next studio. Is seniors is Sina Sav Savbadi. She's a graduate of UCLA. She voted for your father in 2008. Yeah. She supports Romney. She does not like the Tea Party. She supports marriage equality. Any question or comment, Sina? Hi, Larry. Uh, my question is to you and the panel. Do you think that Vice President Biden has a, a career in the future in the Democratic Party, possibly as President of the United States? He's 69 years old. Um, F no. No. <laughs> no, F not no. to be rude. No way. Know? There's no way. There's going to be a lot of new blood coming up 2016, a lot of new blood. And it is now with the old. No way. Well, on the Democratic side, you're going to see Cuomo. Well, you know what? It's Hillary Clinton's if she exactly. wants it. If she stands up and says, I want it. If not, it's going to be fascinating. I think Andrew well, Cuomo Andrew is going to be very Andrew's strong. Andrew's already said if Hillary gets in, he won't. Well, he can't. They, Joe Biden's already, I mean, he said, he said when he was put on the ticket four years ago that he wasn't really. You know what? Trump he's going to be, what, 73, 74 by the time yeah. the second term ends, if they get in a second term. He's going to make a lot of money in speeches, play yeah. a lot of yeah. golf, spend time with his yeah. grandchildren. Yeah. Look, I mean, the public's already rejected him. You want to talk yeah. about Biden's? I mean, that's, the, that's the one coming up. Let's say Romney loses. Right. Who's the Republican comer? I think the big ones, Marco Rubio mm -hmm. is super strong. You know, Florida, Latino. 
know. Marco Rubio. Has to lose weight. No. See, I think, I think Marco Christie Rubio and Paul it. Ryan are the two strong front runners. I think and Jed and Bush Christie is the big, behind them. the big question mark if Jed Bush wants to run. I don't think, I think Chris Christie kind of blew it. My heart was with him forever. I mm. loved him. My Tony Soprano, New Jersey, How did he blow talker. It? Just on the convention, the speech was so inappropriate, so ill timed. All about himself. I, I hated it, and I love the man, or I did. Mm. And I think Marco Rubio really did a fantastic job. I think Marco job. Rubio will be the nominee, and, you know, God yeah. forbid Obama wins, he'll be the president. Marco will be in 2016. How important are the are the major people that we know in America? Are they out and about? Is your father out and about for Romney? Is there? Oh yeah, he's yeah. Working his tail off, campaigning for him. He was just in Florida. They're get, he's got Romney's got all the circuits out as President Obama does. All the guys are out for Obama. Yeah, I think that uh, you know having uh, President Clinton is out he out there, and around? Yeah, he's been out and around, and I think he's going to continue to be out and around. Uh, you know, I think that Democrats, as far as Clinton goes, are still riding the high from his convention speech, and he's going to have to keep making versions of that speech from now until election day. He is their ace in the back pocket. Bill Let's go back over to David Begno. What's the latest on, up on the board? Larry, it's interesting. Millions of people still tweeting as we are on the air tonight. When we first started the show, economy was the top top topic. But look at this. Abortion. Howard was right. That has really become a big conversation topic. Economy now second. 200,000 tweets about both. Health care followed by Iran. Still a lot of people tweeting about Iran tonight. The middle class and Libya. Uh, with everything we've seen tonight, Larry, I've got a question for you. With all the debates, um, all the programs, the shows and the election nights that you've hosted and anchored, uh, do VP debates matter? I, I never thought they had a long lasting impact because they always come second. And then as soon as the third presidential debate takes place, everybody forgets. This campaign is week by week. This was a very important mm -hmm. debate for, for, for Biden to be for their seat week. for this week. And the fact that abortion is the number one trending Twitter tro topic, the, the Obama camp has to be ecstatic but that's about biased, that. Though, and how, I think vote. Howard would even admit this, is that younger people are on Twitter and younger people care about social issues more than older voters. So that's why you're seeing that. I don't think that's representative of the country. What's the impact, Megan, do you think, of this whole, so, which he explained, there was no Twitter four years ago in the campaign. We didn't Thank discuss God it. Thank God for that. I should not have been on Twitter four years ago. What? <laughs> Are you a victim of Twitter? Oh, I have messed up things in my life on Twitter. Children out there everywhere, teenagers, be careful what you put on Twitter. Do not be impulsive. Do not drink and tweet. I learned this a long time have ago. You, <laughs> have you lost a relationship on Twitter? No, but I, it gets tricky when you got ex-boyfriends on Twitter. You unfollow, follow. It's, it's such a modern thing. I don't know how What should I, I do? My, I, I'll ask all of your advice as a, as a slightly older gentleman. I may be off topic, but it applies better to what I'm hearing here tonight. I have a 13-year-old son. He's an athlete. He's a wonderful kid. Chance, his younger brother, Canon 12, to a lesser degree. But Chance is never off his thing. Never off his thing. Is he on Facebook Walking Facebook home Twitter? from school, yeah. Both? Bumps, he bumps into trees. <laughs> I think... He has a quarterback. He would go back to pass with one hand and Twitter a message with the other. He will broadcast his own baseball games. I, what is it? What is it about this? It's the immediacy. You know, it's the yeah. fact that we can connect with all of these different people all around the world immediately and get reactions from them and hear what they've got to say. I mean, there's, there's something about the immediacy of it. Uh, it's really made the world a lot smaller. It's made our political community smaller. Any, I think it's fantastic. Any danger? It's statistically more addictive oh. than um, nicotine or sex. Also, well, I think Twitter. she brought up something interesting. <laughs> and look, technology, I mean, it all does revolve around sex at the end of the day. I mean, people use Facebook and Twitter to find a girl, or whatever that may be. I mean, that's a lot of what driving. I mean, not these debates, but when you're in high school, that's what you're doing. You're hitting on girls. Uh, well, <laughs> listen, let me say this. You know, it is the immediacy, it's how they communicate. You remember, I mean, I'm a little older than most of these panelists, too, and I can tell you. I'm not quite that old, but you remember when a long distance call used to be a big deal? <laughs> you remember? I had a cousin call me last week and he goes, I live in Atlanta, but I'm in California and I couldn't come to California without calling you. I'm thinking, what the hell's wrong with you? You can't call from Atlanta like I care. And why do people <laughs> say that a text is a call? I spoke to him. Did you speak? No, I didn't speak to him. I texted them, right? Same difference. That's their moment of communication. <laughs> and as a parent, let me tell you, I deal what, with this all the time. What is the need? You better know what he's saying, and you should be following your What kid. is the need, I David, agree. for these people, do you think, to Twitter, uh, to tweet? 
It connects them, Larry, to people who they otherwise would never meet. They can tweet you, and you may respond to them. They could never get in touch with Larry King. Anderson Cooper today literally had a throwdown on Twitter with a woman who said, you know, she took exception with an interview he did. He called her a coward. This is an influential television celebrity who's got millions of followers. Twitter allows people to interact with Meghan McCain and other people. No, but seriously, that's what it is. So, I mean, when I hear Andy, respectfully, when I hear you sort of downplay social media, it's it's like, listen, you can either get it and you can realize that everybody's on it and it does matter, or you can dismiss it. And uh, I think it comes to bite you in the ass. I think we have another student, if I'm correct, Casey Marie Tung, a UCLA junior in political science. Her home is Hawaii. And she likes President Obama. Do you have a question or a comment, Casey? Hi, I do. Um, Joe Biden mentioned how he asked America how much we trusted him. And I was just wondering how much you think that the trust factor will play in the election. I think it's about history. I think what Joe Biden was saying, look at the history of Joe Biden, of Barack Obama, of the Democratic Party for standing up for the middle class voter. I think that was his message. <laughs> and I don't think, no matter how well it's explained, I don't think a lot of people, even if they're 54, under 55, I don't think they understand vouchers and what it means, and I think it makes them feel uncomfortable. Do you think Biden scored a point getting in the 47%? Absolutely. Thing? I think he scored big with that, but, and he repeated it, if you noticed. He kept 11 driving, times, I think. Yeah, he just <laughs> kept driving that point home. And it was really one of the big criticisms that people had of Obama, is that here you are meeting, you know, you're podium to podium with Mitt Romney, and then you ignore the fact that he treated almost half the country like we're just losers. What do you, Andy, as a Republic, as a conservative, uh, be an objective journalist for a second. What do you think happened to Obama last week? I mean, obviously right. he's a major debater. I think he had to. Speaker. He had to decide. You know, just thinking in his head, he could come out in two ways. He could come out super aggressive or kind of underwhelm. There was a happy medium that he clearly missed. But if he had come out over aggressive, then all the headlines would be, "Oh, well, Obama's a tyrant, and this is proof that he doesn't listen to people in the White House, and he just does his own thing and goes his own way." <clears throat> so, if there's any positive for him. I would rather have the headline of, oh, I came out weak, so that way you come out in round two, and the headline is, Obama comes back swinging, you know, return of the comeback kid. So he's got that going. He could have an upswing, but you can't recover from the, he was King Obama, the tyrant, and he was constantly interrupting. So it's so, better to underwhelm than overwhelm. Interesting point. Would you agree with that, probably? I, I would agree. I mean, I think that, you know, we were talking about this at the end of the last debate, which was, you know, and I think that the panelists were much more generous to the president's performance than everybody else outside of the panel. Yeah, they were. Um, because I think that a lot of folks thought that, as Andy said, there's a really delicate balance. You know, you can't be unpresidential. You can't be overly uh, aggressive. Independents don't necessarily like it, but, you know, query whether or not he struck the right balance. We only have about five minutes left. We're going to hear from one more student in a moment, but... Uh... David, what do you have over there now? Your Facebook page is just really blowing up. My uh, Facebook page. Your Facebook page. Uh -huh. Nancy leaving a comment uh, on your Facebook page, Larry. Biden was absolutely despicably rude, probably knowing Ryan had honest facts for the listeners. Io, Joe did extremely well. Melanie, Biden, no class at all. Kathy, great job, VP Biden. Ali, smoking Joe Biden, slammed it. Maria, Joe Biden's experience showed woefully. And Suzanne, Republican math just does not add up. I what think... When we take into account all 700 comments we got on your page, people think Biden won. But I think there are people reinforcing their own opinion. Yeah. yeah. I'd be curious what people would say on my public Facebook page, too, because there's probably a lot of Republicans saying <laughs> I wonder that they if anyone, But people know you're a Republican strategist. I wonder so. if anyone said, I had no idea who I'd be for, and I'm sold on Ryan. Or I'm Why not? This wasn't that yeah. debate. Why not? Yeah. This was not that debate, that and this debate exists. wasn't yeah. going to change yeah. it. And I want to address something you said. Mm -hmm. You know, as bad as it is to be a 20-year-old kid without a job, living in your childhood bedroom at home, mm -hmm. there's only one way to make it worse, with a pregnant girlfriend who can't get an abortion. <laughs> okay? And I think that's oh a true, it's oh an my. absolute but true concern. You know what? I, I remember being in college. I remember friends that had to make that very difficult decision and stood by them when they did it. And yeah, one more the fact that it's trending is a huge deal. One more college comment. I think James Wren is with us, UCLA senior in political science, describes himself as physically conservative and socially right-leaning, is United States Army Reserve veteran. James, you have a question or comment? Yes, sir, Mr. King. Obviously, people are going to be talking about who won tonight, but the other uh, simultaneous storyline was this was Congressman Ryan's introduction to a large percentage of the voters who have never seen him before. So I just want to get your take on how you think uh, people will perceive him. 
Good question. Start with you, Megan. First of all, thank you for your service, James. Um, secondly, uh, I don't know if this was the greatest introduction to Paul Ryan. He has a tendency to come off very professorial, and I think I don't really think I saw the charismatic Paul Ryan that I like so much tonight, but I don't think he was really given the opportunity. I think it was just a crossfire fight fest. Uh, second, Megan, on thanking you for your service, I do think that I've seen Paul Ryan be stronger than he was tonight. I've seen him be more charismatic. I felt like he was um, a little uncomfortable at times. He was stumbling a little bit, and he seemed a little edgy. Like there was a while, you know, I, I, the vice president may have been a little too teethy. Uh, I think that. Uh, but remember, it was his was first edgy. time in a national. Right, and I think I just think Ryan was a little edgy at the outset. What do you think, Andy? I don't think Ryan hit a home run, but I don't think he struck out. He was down the middle somewhere. But part of his personality, I mean, he really, he's a number two guy. He's a congressional guy. I don't see him being president of the United States. This just confirms that. He doesn't have the soaring attitude of a Marco Rubio. Howard? Yeah, I, and his lack of specificity. You know, he took heat a couple weeks ago on Fox for not being specific about the math. He took it here tonight. It's going to come up in the next debate, and there should have been a better have, answer for these people. They're going to be forced to say, what are their proposals? There should have been. You know it's happening, Larry. You've got to be prepared. Right, we're going to wind things up. A little final comment. David? Larry, it was a record-breaking night for Twitter. Say what you might substantially on the substance of the evening, but stylistically from people tweeting and leaving comments on your Facebook page and the four million tweets that came in tonight, um, people loved it. They actually thought it was fun to watch. What we saw last night, in the form of tweets with, were people who love politics and studied it and followed it and thought it was boring as all get out. Tonight, it was a show, and they enjoyed watching it. And by the way, don't forget, you can subscribe to YouTube.com slash Aura TV. We'll see you all Tuesday night following the second uh, presidential debate, the third debate in the series. And uh, when, as we leave you, we're going to remind you, we thank you for watching us on YouTube Spotlight. And remember that... Uh, I'm with you every day on uh, Hulu via Aura TV, and you've got a chance if you haven't seen that. This is our very homespun set. We're going to trust it back now to David Begno. He's going to take over. He's got his own deal going from now on. David, it's yours. Thank you, Larry. And guests joining me now live via Google Hangout is Trisha Paytas. Trisha uh, has an interesting story. She's a bit of a YouTube rock star. She is a former stripper who converted to Catholicism likes to say that she got her life straight, changed her ways, and interestingly, um, made a YouTube video recently where she started talking about why she liked Mitt Romney. She is not here. Okay. Well, we'll keep talking about Trisha while we try and establish with her. Nonetheless, she did a video on YouTube about Congressman, or uh, rather presidential candidate, Mitt Romney. In the video, um, she stated that she was voting for him. She was for the GOP candidate, and she wanted to vote for him. That video went viral. She usually gets a couple hundred thousand views on YouTube, which is pretty impressive. This one got her over a million. She is joining me now. Trisha, can you hear me? Trisha, are you there? As we always say, this is live television, so I love this. You're watching us and joining us on YouTube. We appreciate that. Uh, Trisha, you there? All right, we are still trying to establish with Trisha. We are done. So, we apologize for the technical difficulties. We thank you for watching. Don't forget, we'll be, we'll be back again next week for the next presidential debate. We'll see you then. Please subscribe to our YouTube page or at TV slash Larry King. Thank you.